singing on here. We're live. What you think about that? We're live, Kyle. We sing a uh, sing a song. Sing a song. Shane's sing gonna a sing song. a song. Sing a song. All right. Rusty Hooks live episode number. I don't know. Thirty eight. Is it thirty? I think it's been a lot. It's been a while. Corey, it's good to have you here with us tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, We are going to dive right into the nitty-gritty of it all. F1s and spotted bass. Okay. I'm going to let a few more people get on here. And, Brandon, I know we're late, sir. There were two people that had to use the little boys' room. We had to make time for He can't fuss. He ain't even here. Unfortunately, Brandon is not with us because... uh, He took the week off. He took the week off. (laughs) He he needed a break. So, we have Corey here to answer any questions about the F1 stocking experiment, we'll call it. Uh, Is it a program yet? We take questions later. Let him him explain what he needs to... That's right. That's right. What he needs to talk about. Is it, a, is or, it a, or what we need him to talk about? Is it a way. program yet, or, or what, what's the status here, sir? Well, first I'll introduce who I am so that everybody knows who I am. Um, I'm Corey Oakley. I am the uh, Piedmont Fisheries Supervisor uh, for the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission, and basically my work group covers um, from basically the the southern half of the Catawba drainage. Um, east across the Yadkin PD and then the the Triangle Lakes and then over into the the Roanoke drainage so that would be Gaston and Roanoke Rapids and all that area so uh, we cover a lot of areas Um, as far as the F1s no it's not a program yet so what we decided to do was start uh, an experiment um, at Lake Norman to test whether we could augment or enhance the largemouth bass population uh, with the stocking of F1s. And so uh, the, the Lake Norman Legends group uh, approached us about uh, being able to help us in that and provide fish for us um, with that. And so they're helping with, with purchasing the fish, but our plan right now is to um, stock fish over the next few years and watch how um, those fish progress through the system. We have them tagged. You won't be able to visibly see them tagged, but we have them tagged. But we'll be able to see how they progress through the system over the next few years, see if they're contributing to the largemouth bass population, and see if there is a difference in the overall condition and potentially in the overall numbers of largemouth at Lake Norman. So that's that's the whole crux of, of what the project is about in real short term. All right, Shane. Well, I'm I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm trying. I'm trying to learn tonight. I don't want to. I'm all ears. Don't. <laughs> yeah, obviously. <laughs> well, I, can, I can sit here and talk for hours, but that's yeah. probably not what well, you want me to do. No, so I, mean, I mean, we we actually you know, do. We we we're the goal with this is to educate people about and, and, uh, what and, it's, and us too. Because I mean, you know, dude, you got you got this group over here, nine nine nine. This group over here, nine nine nine. And you guys are kind of in the middle. So by having you on here tonight, hopefully we can get the two groups together. And you know, I had I had a discussion with with somebody the other the other day about they were fussing because I was against this whole thing, and I'm not at all against it. I, the only thing I was against from the get go was killing all the spotted bass. I mean, you know, obviously Lake Norman back in the day was the Dead Sea, as it was actually sure. known as that. Sure. And until we had spotted bass, it was still the Dead Sea. Sure. And now it's still, it's not a trophy fishery, it's not a world class fishery right now, but right now it is a decent fishery. And, you know, when me, I travel all over the, the, the United States bass fishing. I've been to all the held smallmouth lakes, all the largemouth lakes, and sure, they're great, but. You know, it's still nice to come home and have some more decent to go fishing. Understood. And yeah. and by and by saying that, you know, I don't want I don't want anybody to think I'm against what's happening at Lake Norman. I'm one hundred percent all for it. Like I said, I just don't want to kill all the spotted bass. So, and and if whatever we gotta to do to improve it, you know, I'm 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 willing to do whatever I can to help it. So I'm gonna make this statement here, Corey, I said earlier I would debate on it. Facebook is full of biologists. 
Sure. Okay. Especially Carolina Elite <laughs> Series. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Uh, all, I'm sure you, know, you do. Facebook's full of biologists. And there's only one person that I know that actually has a certificate. I'm well, assuming there's, there's that's more than that. Framed. It's a degree that says, I am authorized to talk about this, know about this, and to share data about this. Sure. So the goal with this is to educate people, to, to clear up questions from the people that aren't necessarily in favor of it or think it's a dumb idea or think it's just not going to work. Understood. And also reaffirm to the guys that are 100% for it what they're doing. And, yeah. you know, first first question that's popped up here is uh, Matt Haywood asked, why is the state not helping with funding? So... So the st- so the state is helping with funding because our time and our effort is is it's fun- money is funding money. yeah it costs money um, it costs money but uh, so the way the way our budgets work is we have to budget out a, a basically a year in advance mm-hmm. um, so when when Michael and I were talking Michael Fox who's with the Lake Norman Legends when he and I were discussing this I told him that we, our budgets were already were already attributed out. You know, so to speak, and if he wanted to raise money um, to to stock F ones, we were very interested in that. But you know, in the future, we're going to be the ones buying the F ones or making the F ones at our hatcheries. We haven't decided how we're going to do that in the future. But for this year, um, we just couldn't do that. We just didn't have the money. We it was already allocated out to a bunch of other projects that we were already working on. And a lot, of, a lot of I don't mean to interrupt, but a lot of people don't realize that. That these things are, especially when it comes to state funding, these things are laid out years in advance. For sure. As to, and, and there again, um, the other day, you know, I, I talked, I was talking to have a conversation with this person. I'm not going to call any names, but you know, I told him, I said, I'm thankful, glad that you guys got together and went to the state with this because, now correct me if I'm wrong, the state allocates X amount of dollars for the fisheries every year, right? So, so. We can back way on up, and this is probably way getting down in the weeds. How, how we're funded is through what we call sport fish restoration dollars. And so every time you buy bait and every time you buy gasoline that goes in your boat, um, every time you buy fishing rods, every time you buy a boat, anything that's related to the industry, there is an inherent tax that's in that bait. Uh, as baits are sold here, there's an inherent tax that's in that bait that goes into the federal sport fish restoration fund pot okay and then we're given x amount of dollars based on how many licensed anglers we have in the state of north carolina and so that's that's the money we get annually and we know basically going into the year this is how much money we're going to get this is how much and we spend basically every dime of it because it right. ain't that much yeah um across the state so for instance for inland fisheries working in the state of north carolina y- you know you're looking at and this includes a lot of things like access, all those kinds of things, including the biological work and all the employees that are involved in it, growing trout in the mountains, growing catfish for for different uh, programs, that kind of stuff. Um, You're looking at somewhere around $7 million that comes to the state of North Carolina through that program. And so that funds all the work that we do. Mm -hmm. Um, $7 million don't go far, especially when you're dealing with, you know, uh, all the different types of work that we do. So um, once it's been allocated to a project, you know, we can't really take that back and put it towards another project unless it just becomes something that we really have to do, you know, now. Right. Um, so that's where the raising of the money came in to, you know, help us get jump started with the knowledge that we were going to take over this in the future. Right. Um, so it's it's not, to answer that guy's question, it's not that we're not allocating funds, it's just that we're not buying the fish right now. for Yet. this fall and this spring, this coming spring. Right. But we will be buying the fish in the future. Right. Or, or when I say buying, we could be raising the fish in the future. Well, yeah. but the bigger thing that people need to realize is, you said it, $7 million dollars. It doesn't go far. To go to every lake in North Carolina, every piece of woods, enforcing, upkeep, well, management. It, 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 that's just the biological side of it. That's not enforcement. And that's, I mean, not, that's not the game lands. They get different pots but, of money. But but the point of it is, is you're really underfunded 
Well, when you, well, I'm not going to say I know that. You, I, know you can, <laughs> I know you cannot but say that. But I, What I try to tell people is, think about $7 million and how much it costs to run a public school. One public school. Yeah. And one public school probably costs, you know, one high school probably costs $7 million to run in the state of North Carolina. And we're doing that fisheries work all the way across the state with that $7 million. It stretched really thin. It gets stretched yeah, thin fast. I get it. it. It doesn't go far. So I'm not filthy rich, and I'm not a filthy rich person. So anyway. <laughs> all right. So everybody's rolling questions in. We're going to get to every one of them. We're going to try to. We're going to get. <laughs> we're going to do our best to get it I to everybody. I think it might be good if I if I kind of give basically a case history of bass at the lake, if people don't know that. What do you think? Please do. I, I think. Please I think, do. I think yeah. Go ahead. Come a on. Case history of. <laughs> 20 years ago to now, sure. numbers up and down, yeah. and then we will get to these questions sure. because so, they are rolling in. So, so, you know, originally Lake Norman was a largemouth bass lake. Um, if you go prior to the late 1990s, early 2000s, that's what it was. Um, it, and when I say largemouth bass, mm. that was the bass species on the lake. Um, those fish were known for being in poor condition not being they didn't look when i say poor condition it means they weren't fat you know they were skinny fish very thin um didn't didn't grow real well um that yeah. was that was kind of the that was the lake norman largemouth um for the most part that doesn't mean you wouldn't catch a fat one every now and then but for the most part on average that's what they were then in the late 90s early 2000s we're not sure we think about 99 maybe 98 uh, spotted bass is what everybody calls them, but their actual species name species is Alabama bass. Looks mm-hmm. just like a spotted bass. Were introduced into the lake, and they have subsequently taken over the lake for the most part. What they have done is they have become the dominant bass species in the lake. They primarily are pretty much lake wide, but they really do well in main channels out in the main lake. Um, they've pushed the largemouth kind of to the backs of coves and the backs of creeks. That's where largemouth can st- can still thrive okay, at on. the lake. Stop talking about that now for the guys that are still trying to figure out how to catch largemouth. We want to keep that in mystery. <laughs> <laughs> well, so and so that's what's happened. And so what we're now left with, um, for the most part, is a predominantly dominated fishery that is what I call spotted bass. Everybody calls Everybody them, spots. Calls even them though, spots. Even though they're Alabama bass, it is a spotted bass. Um, with very few largemouth. The largemouth that we now see have better condition than the largemouth from 30 years ago. Absolutely, they do. And the spotted bass, for the most part, are fairly small, um, have fairly poor condition. Um, The condition is about what the largemouth were 30 years ago when you look at the condition factor. Um, And that's an equation that's calculated, and I can show that on a graph what they look like. But they're in the... I believe they're either in the high 70s, low 80s, and you want them to be around 100, the score that they score Mm -hmm. when we do that calculation. And so what I tell people is a fish that's in the high 70s looks like he needs to eat a cheeseburger, which is not me. You know, know, it's, it's, it's the skinny ones. And so that's predominantly what we have. That doesn't mean you don't see spotted bass, um, you know, get to three pounds or get to four pounds. You know, those fish do occur. Um, but what we're looking at as biologists is not what anglers look at. Anglers are looking at what, you know, my best five for the day. What we're looking at are the fish as Your best 1,500 for the day. (laughs) Well, maybe not 1,500, but my best 500. Yeah. You know, and and my 500 show me that we are dominated by smaller, skinny fish in the system. And so that's what we have at Lake Norman. So the impetus for the project, uh, the F1 project, is really not about Alabama bass. It's really about largemouth and trying to make largemouth bass better um, and trying to get a little bit faster growth rate, hopefully a little bit better condition. Um, and like I said, if they can increase their numbers somewhat through stocking, great. I don't know that that's going to occur. But as I've told people, it's an experiment. I don't have a guaranteed outcome. There is no guaranteed outcome. Um, we can talk about all, all things biological tonight, and there are no guarantees. You know, um, it, that's just not the way the biological world works. We try stuff. Sometimes we fail. Sometimes we succeed. Um, but that's but if we don't try, we don't ever know. That's what I tell people. 
Right. So it's worth, for the Wildlife Resource Commission, it's worth us trying to see if we can make it better. That That's all I, I mean, that's not all I know to say, but that's what I know to say I mean, about those. Those the are right. the facts. It's yeah, an experiment. Those, yeah. it's, that's those right. Are the facts. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not, it, this, we're, you're talking, honestly, before we really know how well it's going to work, we're probably in the four to six year range. Which. I mean, honestly, because you got to get fish to grow up through the system and get, because that's really the fish that you guys catch mm-hmm. is really from about age three to about age seven. And then, you know, those are the dominant fish that most of largemouth and, and, and even the spotted bass, a lot of those fish are age three to age seven. All right, now you're talking about the, the your time frame here. What is what is the growth rate of, let's say, a northern strain largemouth versus the F1? It's, it's, I mean, I don't have those numbers in front of me, so I, I probably should have that, like, poof, right on the top of my head, and I don't. <laughs> um, obviously, the northern, so what you get from an F1 is you get the 50% cross of a northern with a Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still all largemouth. I mean, there's some geneticists, which we call them lumpers and splitters out there, that say maybe the Florida is its own species now, and it's not a largemouth anymore, but it's, they're, they're considered subspecies of largemouth, the northern and the Florida. And so what you get is you get that 50% together of northern and Florida, and that gives you what we call hybrid vigor. And it makes the fish eat more, grow faster, get bigger. And that's true, uh, like if you compared an F1 to a Florida, you're probably going to get better growth in that F1 than you are in a pure strain Florida. Just because you got that hybrid vigor. It's not so te- as temperamental as a straight 100% Florida Exactly, bass. exactly. Right. So, you know, whereas northerns will bite after a cold front and Florida's won't. Lock up tighter than Dick's hat band. That's right. <laughs> and you won't get that. Hopefully you won't get that with a, with an F1. Yeah. You'll get the growth of a Florida with the biting potential of a northern. Yeah. You know, that's really what we're looking for. The thing about F1s, though, are if it is successful... You know, we're stocking F1s. Right. Because once an F1 reproduces, it's no longer F1. That's right. You know, if it, if an F1 reproduces with a Florida, with a pure strain Florida, we don't have F1s. The babies aren't F1s anymore. That's right. They're something else. All right. So, we just don't know what yet. Sure. <laughs> so so that's the gist of where this is at. So that we're not here for the entire evening and we can keep everybody happy with answering questions. Um first question that popped up after the state not helping with funding is can largemouth and spots coexist well they're coexisting right now uh in lake norman um i don't think they coexist well together and and i will bait i'll couch that on it depends on the system so what we found with alabama bass or spotted bass in north carolina is that they are an invasive species you know, you made the, you made the statement before we went on camera that I love spotted bass and I don't want to kill them all. Mm-hmm. Well, I would tell you that spotted bass are a scourge, and and the reason I say that is if we put it if if Lake Norman is in a bubble, mm-hmm. okay, and, and that's all we're talking about is Lake Norman. I might not care so much about spotted bass. I do think the spotted bass have probably made fishing a little bit better. Oh, it's made it a hundred times better and, and than what it was can, 20 years ago. We now. can argue about that, you know, what's yeah. better, what's not better. It's all in, you know, in your mind. But what what happens is, is those Alabamas have not stayed there. Those Alabamas have they've spread made, like wildfire. They've made their way through the whole Catawba chain. And now they're in the Yadkin PD chain. And now they're in the Roanoke chain. The only place that we don't have them right now in North Carolina, in the major reservoir chains, is in the Triangle Lakes, in the Falls, the Jordan, and the Harrison. People, if y'all, please don't take them there. <laughs> um, yeah, please don't take them there. Because what we're seeing is, in certain condition, under certain conditions, like a Norman, a Belize, a Lake James, a Gaston, is within five years, it is pretty close to being 50-50, mm-hmm. spotted, largemouth, within 10 is spotted bass and what we're seeing at like a lake james for example which is a pretty well-known smallmouth bass fishery yeah is that what they're going to do there is where with largemouth they push their habit them out of their habitats they basically inundate them with so many alabama bass that the largemouth go i don't want to be there no more i'm going over here and they're 
and the largemouth habitat is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as the Alabamas are pushing out into the system. That's not what they do with smallmouth. They interbreed with smallmouth. I've seen that up and there they, fishing. And they make what everybody calls a mean mouth. Yep. But what happens is, is that mean mouth goes away, and so does the smallmouth, and all you end up with is Alabama bass. I guess it kind of be like breeding like you were talking about a minute ago, F1 and a Florida bass. Yep. Once they breed, you lose the F1 yep. gene. And you all lose you the mean mouth. You'll you'll keep a little bit. You know, it might start off being fifty fifty, then it goes sixty forty, then it's seventy thirty Alabama, then it's eighty twenty ninety ten, and then it and it goes down even more to when it's all just one until they Alabama. eventually they just breed till them out till they're gone, and then we don't have smallmouth anymore. Right. And so, I guess that's where you know we probably disagree. Is that you know if it was just in Norman, I think as a the wildlife commission probably could live with that. But the fact is, they haven't stayed there. Yeah, they've moved all over the state. They've moved all over the Appalachian reservoirs, even even out in the western part. You know, you go out towards Fontana, Saint Tietla, and all those. Yeah, they're all out there. Um, they're yeah. just everywhere now. And now, now, as far as that, I guess that comes from people moving them. It's all well, you know, it, you could move them to Norman, and they would drop to Mountain Island. And Lake Wiley and on further down, just going through the dam. Just through the floods and but things like that. But moving them up, that's yeah. people moving People's them up. People's moving them, yeah. Moving them over to the Roanoke, that's people moving yeah. them to the Roanoke. You yeah. know, that's people. That's not us. That's anglers that are putting fish in their live wells saying, I think they'd be great at Lake Gaston and putting them at Lake Gaston. Yeah. To put it, put it in perspective at Lake Gaston, six years ago, I don't think we knew of a spotted bass on Lake Gaston. I might have my years wrong. Three years ago or, or four years ago in the survey, they were like 8 to 9% of the population was spotted bass. Two years ago, they were 38% of the population was spotted bass. Wow. So it's it's very quick. When they, when they decide to take over and what that mechanism is, we really don't know. Um, we think cl- the clearer the water the quicker the over the overtaking. So they're in places like Rhodius and Hickory and they seem to be in very low numbers. And we don't you know, but they're pretty turbid, you know, pretty dirty water, yep. you know, not clear water. Um so we're not real sure what the mechanism is that drives it, but we do know that in clear water situation, if a if a Alabama bass gets introduced, it's it's, it's gonna there. take over. I'll tell you something else I've noticed that I I don't think that they like a whole lot of grass. I, I think you're probably right. You know, I, think, I think we've seen that in, in yeah. other states. Other so states have pretty much shown that, that bring, as well. That brings up the next question. What is your stance on introducing water willow? I know Kelly. All for it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Cut and dry. <laughs> the state's all for it, guys. Now you just got to get Duke Energy and the Lake Commission so, on board. So <laughs> I'll, no, I'll explain that a little bit. So at Lake Norman, and I can really only speak to Lake Norman, and, and it's true of the other Catawba Lakes as well. Um, what you have is you have a lot of landowners that live on the lake. Mm-hmm. Um, they prefer that, for the most part, I'm, not, I'm, I'm grouping them in a big group, and that's not fair. But for the most part, they're there for land ownership. They're not there for fishing. Right. Some of them are. Don't get me wrong. But for the most part, that's yeah. Not most the case. of them are not. You know, most people that own a, you know, five million dollar house don't want vegetation in front of their house. And so there's a group. There's a Lake Norman Marine Commission that is basically funded by all the municipalities in the area that are in charge of a lot of different things at Lake Norman. And then there's also Duke Energy, who is a partner because they own. They own the water and they own the the they they run the management plan for the lake for the water resources part of it. Right. Um, Duke Energy, you know, as long as we abide by their rules, they would be very much for. In fact, I talked to their plant guy today. His name's Brett Hardis. Um, very very smart guy about plants and is wanting to you know if we can put plants somewhere on Lake Norman, we want to do it. Um, we need something. The, the, and we know that. And so it's not. It's been tried, so that's part of it. We have tried water willow in places in Lake Norman, and the biggest problem with introducing a plant to Lake Norman, it, particularly like water willow or the, the shoreline variety plants, um, the things that come up out of water stick to the shore, mm-hmm. is the wave action, boat boat traffic. Boat traffic just beats it to death. Yeah. And so that's the difficult. So what we have to do, so for instance, if you go up in the river, 
you see a lot of there's a lot of maiden cane up there along the shoreline unless it's been blowed out from the <laughs> recent floods <laughs> but there's a lot of maiden cane around those islands which looks it doesn't look like water willow but it's the same kind of plant it grows right in the water's edge comes out maybe maybe six to seven feet from the shore and it's big thick green stuff it's a little thicker than water willow in terms of its density um, but we have a lot of maiden cane up there, but we also don't have a lot of boat traffic up there. Um, and that's why I think it's gotten established there. Whereas, you know, down lake, it, I mean, we've tried to do it like at Lake Norman State Park, tried to establish water willow there, didn't make it. And part of it is soil type, even though water willow pretty much grow in concrete. Um, <laughs> part of it is soil type, but for the most part, it is, it, it's basically boat traffic. So we're going to have to find places that don't get that heavy boat traffic to establish those shoreline type plants. Um, I'd love to to plant like a um, like an eelgrass. There was eelgrass that was growing down. Yes, we had a lot of eelgrass. Down, and well, the, it, the it, grass it, carpet wiped that. It out. was from Ram, it was from Ramsey all the oh, way yeah. all the way up almost to what we call no man's land. Yeah, we we would love to see something like that establish itself, but. I just don't think there. There's just not enough momentum. There's gonna to have to be more momentum from anglers to get that push to to make that happen. If that makes any sense, because yeah. the landowners don't want stuff like that. They right. don't want things that grow around their docks. They and I'm just, you know, it's it's a lake that's getting multiple uses, and so I, as a commission biologist, I have to balance all of those things. You yeah. know, I'm I'm here to promote fishing and and fisheries at Lake Norman, and I would love to see a plant like that growing out there. Absolutely, would love it. Um, but I think it I think it's hard. It's going to be a hard thing to do. All right, guys, you you heard it from the horse's mouth. If you want to try to grow grass, <laughs> get get it just that. as much fired up about that as you did about the F ones, and you probably would gain gain some headway. Gain some it. traction anyway. There yeah. there again. There again, that that goes back to what I said a while ago. You got this bunch over here and this bunch over here yakking at each other. Well, this bunch over here and this bunch over here needs to get right here. There's there's no reason why. And I've I've said that to to mul- I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I'm you're sorry. fine. No, you're good. There there's I've said that to multiple people, um, and I know quite a few in the in the BASS community and and on the national level and and the and the southeastern level is that. If, if y'all could get coalesced together, you know, as a group, as one voice over if it's habitat or whatever it is, you're going to be a whole lot better off than being splintered into oh, a bunch uh, of different groups. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The, the reality it, of it there, is. There's more power in one voice than there is in all these different little things going on. That's there, right. So. The reality of it is there are more bass fishermen in the state of North Carolina than there are homeowners on the water. No, I'm not saying... You don't have that, that kind of money, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, yeah, they can... They, yeah, well, that, that's the problem. I, I mean, the, well, the next question is... Well, second question. <laughs> First question was, will F1s breed with spots? Uh, no, there might be a little bit of hybridization, because there is a little bit of hybridization between spotted bass and largemouth, but it's very minimal. Um, more than likely, no. That, so that's not the case. So William Fraser, if you are watching, there is a little bit of hybridization between spots and largemouth. I guarantee you, Bill's watching. Oh, he is. <laughs> no, he is. And we had this discussion. We talked about that, and he said they haven't been able to prove that it's happened. But I, I don't. I don't have any data. I just know that there is. There's too a, many crossbred fish a, in the lake. Well, it's a largemouth. Okay, an F1 is a largemouth. A large mouth, a large mouth, a large mouth. That's what it is all day long. Even though its genetics is Florida and Northern mixed, it's still a large mouth. That's right. And when spots first came on the scene at Norman, there was hybridization between the spots and the large mouth, even though it was a very small percentage. It was it's not like small mouth. Like small mouth is just like it's just hybrids everywhere. Right. These hybrids is were it is a it lot because less. they spawn Smallmouth spawn a lot like spots, whereas yes. largemouth spawn yes. differently than spots? Well, I would say yes, but we really probably don't know the mechanism that's, that's right. driving okay. it. I mean, honestly, it is this movement of Alabama bass into the southeast from its native, which it's from the southeast, but throughout the southeast, and particularly in North Carolina, because North Carolina is kind of the hotbed for it right now. It, yeah. Um, 
you know, this movement is all very new to science. It is things, we're learning things as we go. And so we don't have the answer for every, you know, every question like that. You well, know, that's why there's experiments like this that are going right. on. So you can gain more data to know how to manage the fisheries better. That's exactly make right. Make fishing better for the four of us sitting in here plus everybody else is watching. That's right. That's what we're here to do. So next question, what can be done to increase the funds that you all receive to make fisheries better? <laughs> buy more baits <laughs> shop local shop, shop local <laughs> come, come down to rusty hooks and buy more baits pay more taxes and you're good to go <laughs> um no i mean i mean there, you can take in-kind donations can you not absolutely if if a corporation i mean it would have to be worked out with people that are far smarter than i am um within the wildlife commission that deals with the money side of life but if a corporation wanted to make money to the, to a specific project or just to the Wildlife Commission, they by all means can do that. We don't get a lot of that, and we also don't go looking for a lot of that either, which is part of, probably part of our fault. Well, I, I tell you, I mean, I know this is going, I'm fixing to really piss some people off. But wait, wait, just, I don't no, want to drop the viewers no, yet. No, 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 no. I know, you know, we kind of we kind of take for granted around here, we don't ever pay a ramp fee around here. Never. There's no ramp fees at Wiley, no ramp fees at Norman. You drive away from this area, you cannot go anywhere on the lake without paying money to launch your boat. I've been... Murray, Hartwell. I mean, it's five bucks, whatever. If you, if you go to like somewhere like Smith Mountain in Virginia, I've never launched for less than $10 up there because they have limited access, mm -hmm. and that's just what they charge. If you go up to like Potomac River, it's 20 25 bucks oh, yeah. to put your boat in the water. Yeah. Because they have limited access. I mean, and I I personally wouldn't see anything wrong with doing that here. If it if it if the money goes back to the fisheries or to to you guys to to allocate for our fisheries, I mean, I wouldn't wouldn't want to sign up to pay a ramp fee to pad somebody's pocket. Sure. But if it helps the cause, I mean, hey, you know that's you think about how many wake boats and how many bass boats get put in at the multiple ramps that we have every year i mean you know you're talking about a lot of money that's out of my league well, I'm, 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 I'm just i'm just, I'm just, I'm just using that for an example <laughs> no, I mean, and, and, that's, and, that's and, a fact and people please don't yell at me for saying that i'm just saying you know if we're gonna put money towards making this better let's do it let's go all the way make it right you know i mean whatever it takes all right shane now that we've Actually, gained viewers. So, gained great viewers. <laughs> yeah, um, Michael Kennard asked a question. He I, said, "How did the uh, what keeps the Alabamas from dominating the F ones like they did largemouth?" There, there won't be anything to keep them from dominating F one. So, so we're pretty much where we are at Lake Norman. There's not going to be. I mean, it may oscillate up and down. We may go, you know, ninety percent Alabamas, ten percent largemouth. Then the next year might be ninety two percent Alabamas, or it might be eighty four percent. You know. It goes back and forth just on how well each species reproduces. So we're kind of, I don't, can we show that slide? Um, Is that possible? I can, attempt, that? I can attempt to. Okay. If we get kicked out, I will get, we'll get back on here. Well, I don't want to screw nothing up, so. I already did that. No, we're good. <laughs> oh, we're doing it now. Okay, which slide are we trying to get to? Sorry, guys. Uh, go to that one. This right one right there. here. Yeah. Okay. So this is this is basically our catch rates of largemouth and Alabamas over the last since night uh, mid uh, like ninety two I think, <clears throat> and you'll you'll notice that you know from ninety two to two thousand, um, basically we didn't see an Alabama bass. Alabama's in the red, black is largemouth, and then you see. Alabama show up and you see this oh, big no. spike in Alabama's. I don't know that this is gonna work. Oh, oh it's up there right uh, now. Uh, hit well, that, but hit that button right there. Hit that button right there. There we go. Okay. Hey. Yeah. We're getting it, Brandon. Sorry. Yeah. I'm not trying to botch your job, sir. Sorry. So, uh, once it kind of goes over, you'll be able to see it. But you'll notice that we are where we are since about 2006. For the most part, largemouth really haven't changed. Alabamas fluctuate back and forth for the most part, but they're pretty much the dominant species, and they're kind of everywhere. So go back, going back to your question, you know, will they dominate the F ones? Yes, they will, but that's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is this augment that black line. 
See that black line mm-hmm. there? We're trying to augment that black line. We're trying to make those. Um, it did not work. It's it no. Okay, it, just it get didn't. out of it. Don't worry about it. Sorry about that. All right. Somebody, somebody smarter than us that's not here. Well, I, 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 the resolution size is off, but I'm not sure if I can fix that mid program. That's so fine. don't worry about. It. Sorry, guys. Um, so. What we're trying to do is augment that just that largemouth bass. And what we're trying to do is make those largemouth bass grow a little faster, try to make them put on a little more weight because of the F1 hybrid vigor, and hopefully maybe put a few more largemouth into the system. Now, granted, the fall the fall stocking that we did this year was a really low number. It's very experimental, and we put it in very specific locations. Um, the the spring stocking will be a much larger stocking but the fish will be smaller so it'll be even a greater number of fish so that we can have more effect but um if you want to learn more about that project i should have said this earlier if you want to learn more about that project you can go to our website we have a website up just for lake norman largemouth project um and it is ncwildlife.org slash L K N in big letters and then black bass. So we will post a link. You can to post that. a link to that, yep. and and everybody will be able to find it. It'll have information about the project, where we are with the project, and it will keep updating the project. In fact, there's going to be videos of us tagging. It's not up there now, but there'll be videos of us tagging the fish. You'll be able to see us stocking the fish. Um, you'll also be able to see our as we collect data from the field. How many of these uh, of these F ones are showing up in our samples um, as we go through through time? You know, we can't. You know, we don't have any results now. It's just right. Too, it's way just, too early yeah, way too early. But it'll it'll explain the project maybe a little bit better than probably I'm doing tonight. Is is the stocking project putting the horse before the cart? If you don't address the cover issue first, possibly. Well, I don't know that we can address the cover issue, and I'm not trying to just throw in the towel and be done. I think the cover issue is a much longer term. Well, first off, just to explain habitat and habitat enhancement, which is what that is, mm-hmm. that is a very long-term process. Um, it We're doing that in other lakes. Um, our probably most successful area is Lake Gaston. Um, but we're doing it in some smaller lakes uh, in the Triangle and in the Triad. Uh, we've done a little bit at High Rock. <laughs> but, you know, what we're trying to do is establish different species of plants that fish will use as habitat. And what you have to do is establish colonies. And then as those colonies get hardy enough and big enough, they kind of spread out over time. Just kind of... Disperse. Disperse, yeah. yeah. And so... We're, we've been doing that, well, at Gaston, we've been doing that for, for a, a good while now, almost a decade, and we're seeing real good success in certain species of plants. And then in other places, it's just too short term to have seen any real success at this point. And so, if we don't do anything with largemouth, you say cart before the horse, if we don't do anything with largemouth, and we don't do anything with spotted bass, and, and we wait on the habitat, we're going to be waiting a while. That, that's my answer to that. You know, maybe it is cart before the horse. Maybe you should establish quote-unquote habitat for them prior to that. But we're going to be waiting a while, and particularly at Lake Norman, I think we're going to be waiting a long time. Because it's a, it's, a it's a steep uphill climb at Lake Norman to establish, with all the boat traffic we have at Lake Norman, um, it's going to be a steep climb to establish habitat for those guys. It, it, is the lake technically or... Is it more or less more of a recreation lake than it is a sport fishery? And it, is it is it funded? Are we fighting a battle that's tougher to address or talk about than? Is there more money in the in the in the recreation side than there is the? Uh, well, there might be more side? money, but as a as a fish biologist, that's worked out there for quite some time now. You know. It's a very popular fishing destination, sure. particularly for local people. In the wintertime especially, because you get all those people from up north. You see them here from 
West Virginia, Ohio. Yeah, they now, come down here and fish in the winter. I, you know, I would say, you know, from <laughs> only because we're not frozen over. Mm-hmm. <laughs> from, from Memorial Day to Labor Day, yeah, it's a recreational place. Yeah. But right now, it's a fishing place. That's yeah, right, absolutely. Um, and and spring of the year, it's still a fishing place. And fall of the year, it's a fishing place. You know, dead of winter, it's a fishing place. So nine months out of the year, in my opinion, it's a fishing place. Exactly. Um, you know, recreational, yes, is dominant. Yeah, well, I mean, all of y'all have seen in the it. summertime. I don't, I don't, I don't even. I don't, I don't even I don't go have out to there. Tell you what's happening in the summertime. We carp fish during that time. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> my, yeah. I don't even go out there in the summer. But, it's not worth it. My but, boat's not big enough. Yeah, it's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's some truth in that. But, but, so I don't think that's going back to what you said. I don't think that's exactly. I wouldn't claim it's just a recreational lake. Um, we've we've put too much time and resource into trying to make fishing whether it's we haven't put a lot of time in the in the bass well we have put a lot of time in the bass but you guys haven't seen it um or whether it's hybrids or whatever you know we put a lot of money and time and effort for us to say that it's not a fishing lake i I think what i meant by that is do do the the homeowners have more pull than your recreational i I mean when it comes to when it comes down to the lake norman lake commission Probably so because the fishermen don't know who to contact to ha- have a voice. Yeah. Now I'm not saying it's not that we could, all can't work together, but right now fishermen are just now starting to understand what they really have the power to do if they put their minds together to make it happen. Well, there, there again, you know those guys, the the Lake Norman Legends group, I, the best thing that could have happened was them doing what they done by getting together and going. To the commission and saying, "Look, this is what we want to do." You know, it's prime. I, I tell people it's a prime example of like the guys that the older guys that used to striper fish like Norman all the time. You know, well, when we had the the last striper kill, they decided, "Hey, we're going to go to the commission and ask for hybrids." That's what they did. They all got together and they went and I, asked for I hybrids. Wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily condone all their practices. No, I, I, I think the hybrids are the worst thing that's ever been introduced in the well, life. I wouldn't go there either. <laughs> <laughs> there again, let's agree to disagree. <laughs> we got a bad fisherman. But, but, but for instance, what they did is they went and requested hybrids and then they stocked them on their own three years prior to us doing it. Oh, did so they? I wouldn't suggest. Okay. I, did, I didn't I wouldn't know that. I didn't know that. Going down that route because that's illegal. All right, we got we got to stay we got to stay on track here. I mean, we're we're on, we're, track. We're on track. We're on track. There's a lot of questions. <laughs> yep, I got some too. I know you do. You'll get you'll get your time at the end. <laughs> There's a I'm, lot of drama and just the problem. Extra questions that aren't scientific or actual that is involved in this podcast. The, that's why it's it's fine. I'm the fine. the, the, the pro the. Well, it goes back to everybody's got a biology degree That's behind right. their keyboard. That's right. So, but we're not trying to talk about and that. I don't, nope. under, I don't understand that. I don't understand how all of you have biology. I don't either. Well, I, because I, we I, all I, fish, I, sir. We have rods and reels yes. and boats, and we know it all. I, I feel like everybody, <laughs> there everybody you go. I said fishes it. or donates their money feels vested into the thing, and they've, they've all got their opinion, and they... I don't know why my comments will not let me scroll back up, but Mike Langford, who has been a part of the... He's a part of the Lake Norman he's, Legends. Group. He's a, he's been a big portion of the paperwork end of getting them set up as a nonprofit, and helping them do it the right way. Sure. And he's been asking some questions on here about you, you know what's the long term goal for this experiment for you as the Wildlife Resources Commission to expound on that so everybody gets a fair shake. We can ask the bad questions. But we can also have the good information, sure. Too. So, um, what I what I would say is the long term goal of the F one project is to make largemouth bass fishing and fishing in general better at Lake Norman. Is to grow the size, get them bigger um, through that F one hybrid vigor. That's the long term goal. Um, if we see that it works. You know, the commission knows we're on the hook for raising F ones for a while. You know, for but, you know that that's what we're on the hook for. Right. Um, so we get that. Um, you know, I, I don't know how I can be that. I mean, that's that's plain. That's as plain as I know how to make. It, right. We're trying to make largemouth bass better because yep. we have a section of anglers that love largemouth bass and want to make them better, and and I'm for that. Um, you know, from a 
from a biologic, biological perspective, we can maybe try to do things to make Alabama. I mean, Alabama bass are here. You know, we're not like you're we're not, not going to get rid. We're of not them. getting rid of Alabama bass. So let's right. just live in the real world. We're not getting. But are there things that we can possibly make Alabama bass better? Maybe. But we got to be willing to talk about those things. Yeah, and and that, yeah. that and that's what that's what I said from the get go. I mean, I understand. Yeah, there's there's too many in the lake. I mean, I I agree with that. And do some of them need to be harvested? Absolutely, hundred percent. But that being said, you know, there's people talking about just doing away with them, and, and we can't do that. I mean, well, that's not. It's you're it's, not gonna do you're away. Not with gonna them. Do I don't that. care what unless we unless we drain the lake and get rid of every fish. From the top of the Catawba all the way down, which ain't going to happen. Right. We're not getting rid of Alabama bass. They are here to stay. Okay? So then the question becomes, how can we make Alabama bass? Maybe that's the question you guys want to talk about. I don't know. Um, well, there's, you know, a thinning of the herd would help. And it's going to take a lot of thinning yeah. to help that. And, that. and I'm not, you know, you know, I've heard arguments, well, we shouldn't have put out the rule to get rid of Alabama. Didn't put out the rule to get rid of Alabama bass. No, oh, I said yep. I'll, I'll take ownership. I questioned you on that earlier. Yep. There's several people that have asked yep. why advise to kill a spotted bass. I think based off of our conversation, you're not going to hurt them. You're not so going to hurt them. You, that's exactly you right. as fishermen need to be conservationists. You're go, you're going to actually help them. That's right. Take fish out of the lake, eat them, take them to Raptor Center. What you do with them is on you. Don't whatever. move them. Don't move them. Yeah, don't just take don't them. take them to another lake. If you do move them, move them to the Atlantic Ocean. I don't think they'll make it there for very long, and they'll feed some sharks. Maybe. Um, just, just a thought. But, but yeah. with all that being said, you're not going to hurt the fishery. Shane, would you agree to that? If you start taking 14, 15-inch spots out of there, are you no, going to kill it's, the fishery? It's, it's like I told, told somebody the other day. Guys, if you want to take them out 15 inches and under, I'm your guy. I'll take all. If you can give somebody to eat, let me know. I'll hook you up. But those those that are 15 inches and over, me being a tournament fisherman, I, get it. I want those in the lake. I get it. These these guys don't realize back back in the day when you couldn't catch a 15-inch largemouth at all. But but I, what I would like for everybody to understand is that the Wildlife Commission views it as an invasive fish. I understand. And so it's really not our job so to speak, I mean, this could be debated, and, and there's probably biologists out there going, don't say this. Um, but we really shouldn't be in the business of protecting an invasive fish. So if we put a rule out there to protect an invasive fish, then we're protecting an invasive fish. Now, you can go through our rules, and you'll probably find a protection on an invasive fish. I know there's people <laughs> that's already done it, because I know they're there, so you don't have to go find them for me and put right, them in the right. comment section. If I could get it where we didn't protect any invasive fish, I would, because they don't need any help. I'll, I'll give you one that does have a rule, blue catfish. There's a rule that protects blue catfish. They don't need any help. Which is an invasive species. It's an invasive species. It is not native to the state of North Carolina. Right. It was brought here by biologists. So biologists moved it into the state. So you guys are to blame for that one. <laughs> We're to blame for that one. I mean, so, I mean, so we have just as much mud on our face, just like anglers have mud on their face for bringing in other species of fish. So, but we've learned through time that that's not what we need to be doing and we don't need to be protecting them. Yeah. And so, yes, there's a balance there, Shane, to be honest. You know, if, if you guys decided, if, if your group decided y'all didn't want to keep anything over six, I'm not going to tell you not to do it. I'm just telling you, as a commission, we don't need to be in the business of protecting an invasive so, species of so fish. If it gotcha. is invasive, if it is the and there's all there's native invasives and non-native invasives. If it's so, the dominant fish taking over the lake, why not support that in making it, you know, the biggest? Eliminate the smaller fish or. You hear people talk about pond projects where you've got too many small fish. Yep. You know, eliminate the small well, that's fish. That's the basis of, of all biology. You know, is, uh, you know we've always working said... with a, a biomass. You're looking with... So, this is the way I tell people to... This is about as layman terms as I can put it. If you had a one-acre pasture and you could... 
everybody puts one cow on that pasture and they all do great. And then we put two cows and then we put three cows and everybody's putting their own cows on there. Eventually we're going to run out of pasture, right? Yep. We're, our cows are going to start starving. I was getting ready to say. That's exactly what Lake Norman I was is. Getting ready to it say. is a 32,500 acre pasture for fish. That's what it is. There's only a certain amount of fish, fish being fish. All fish. All fish that will grow in that lake. That's it. That's all you got. Some years it might be a little more. Some years it might be a little, a little less based on nutrient flow into the system. So but that's what you have. And so... That brings up some next questions. Every, every, little, every little piece, you know, if one group has a better reproductive year than another, they might have a bigger portion of that pasture for, that, for, the, for the life of those fish. So that's just how it works. I don't know what your question was. Sorry, I, no, I got lost no, in, my, you kinda, in my nutrient world. Basically, like... I, I feel <laughs> well, like, that's, that's the next road we're going down is nutrients. Yeah, so, like, yeah. I feel like if you fish... I, I've, grown up, I've grown up fishing with guys that fish a jig, fish shallow. Sure. Uh, a lot of times, those guys struggle fishing predominantly largemouth fisheries. I feel like those fish are more lazier than they are on the Norman side of things when those spotted bass are more aggressive. Mm-hmm. Typically at Norman, I always say you make a front of the, front of the dock, middle of the dock, back of the dock cast, move on. Uh, yak and chain fish are a little bit more stubborn. Uh, you got to force feed them. You flip every pole. I might be pissing somebody off by saying that, but if if that tends to be the dominant species at Lake Norman, can you manage it and let it be the dominant species because of well, it's going to be the dominant species whether we manage it or not. Right. So so I think the, people get caught up in the F one thing. Yep. But a four pound fish or a five pound fish, whether it's a spot or a so small mouth, don't matter. The F one project is not going to bring largemouth back back to dominance in the lake. It's not going to happen. So the, it's the, people getting confused that the F one project is to bring largemouth back and get rid of Alabama bass. That okay. is not what this project is that's, about. That's what it I cannot want. work. It will not work. What we're trying to do with the F one project is to make what largemouth bass we have. Better, better. That's okay. what we're trying to do with with the F one project. Now, so can we make? Are back you gonna, to that? are you going to turn Lake Norman into a Smith Mountain? Because that everybody keeps pointing the finger at Smith Mountain. Oh, look what F ones did. Here. I can't guarantee that we are going to turn it into a Smith Mountain. If it does go into a Smith Mountain, fantastic. Uh, but, but, but miracles two, do happen. Miracles do happen. <laughs> but there but again. they are they are two different lakes. So what everybody has to realize about Lake Norman, if you haven't already, is that. Any type of fish growth, whatever it is, it's a hard battle for fish to grow at Lake Norman. I don't care what species, you name it, they all struggle to grow at Lake Norman, and it's because of nutrients. If you catch a blue cat, I don't care how big that blue cat is, I guarantee you he's slower growing and skinnier than a blue cat from the Adkin PD chain at the same age. They just, they just are. So, and, and so it's just a it is a tough environment and I don't care how much habitat you provide it can make it better it can make for better fishing for sure but you cannot get more and bigger out of Lake Norman over a long period of time because of the nutrient issue it just it just doesn't work so so you have to either thin the herd and hope or go ahead what were you going to ask you're, you were about. I think you were about to say it, but I'm not sure. So bringing more cows to the pasture may or may not be necessarily the best answer. So it's a, how how do you fertilize the pasture? You can't okay. fertilize the pasture. You are stuck with the pasture you have. So there is no that, way to. That is where the analogy of pasture goes away. Okay. okay? So, so there so, is yeah. no way to fertilize Lake Norman and make nutrient sources better, with the exception of adding some grass which may or may not grow because they take nutrients to grow as well yeah so the way the food chain works is nutrients flows nutrient is flowing out of the creeks and out of the catawba river coming out of lookout Look shoals mm -hmm. okay that's what's happening and there's been a lot flowing <laughs> there's been a lot flowing if you don't believe it just right over the lake you'll find out um <laughs> But that's where the nutrient source is. And for the lake to be as big as it is, is the largest man-made reservoir wholly within the state of North Carolina. That is Lake Norman. To be as big as it is, it has a very small watershed. Very small. If you look at the creeks, they don't go very far. They don't bring in, they don't cover a lot of land. It's very narrow. 
on, on that part of the Catawba. So there's enough. There's it's, not enough poo poo th- flowing into the lake. Exactly. So <laughs> so basically, what happens is that's why Lake Norman is so clear is because the nutrients get used up very rapidly, and so there's not. And once they're used up, they're used up, and there's none left to have. Whereas if you went to a Lookout Shoals, there's a lot more nutrients there. Lake Hickory, there's more nutrients there. Um, so we need some more cousin Eddie's upstream. Christmas, not, Christmas. Well, right. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple of things, and this has been historic at Lake Norman. Lake Norman has changed somewhat. It's aging, so that has an that has an effect on reservoirs, and the the watershed has changed. What's happening around the watershed has changed. You used to have a lot of agriculture in the upper end of the lake and in uh, in the western half of the lake, western side of the lake, mm-hmm. and all that's gone. That's all houses now. It's all people. So you, and so, the, the what nutrients you get now are from people's lawns, off of roads, which ain't really nutrient. You know, it's more chemicals than it is nutrients. So that's what you're getting more so than you're getting. You know, for, if you get agricultural runoff, you get that dirty water that provides. You know, you get fertilizer from the farmer's fields. You get oh, if it's a cow pasture, you there's get runoff. All that. There's runoff, and you're getting all that nitrogen and phosphorus coming into the lake. So. When you don't have that anymore, you know it's it's not good news for the lake, and it makes it just makes to, it makes growing fish hard. It just does. So I'm gonna ask a question. It might make some people mad, but it's a funny question. Would the money put towards stocking F ones do better buying truckloads of ten, ten, ten? No, because <laughs> and, and so so here's the thing, here's the thing about that is that it is on such a massive scale. And it and the thing about nutrients because it is a still it's still a flowing system, nutrients are flowing in and out, right? Yep. You have to have it coming in all the time. So say we say we say we hired the military to dump, you know, ten 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 from the sky across the lake, and it all turned green today. <laughs> Well, we're going to have to hire them two weeks from now to, hire to, to do 10, 10, 10 again. Yeah. I mean, you, you know what I'm saying? No, I mean, it, it, again, I, I make the comment in jest, but it, it, the, ne- is, the, next pe- the next thing people are asking is, is bait. Okay. But, Jody Wright, Catcher Lures, wants to know, what's your stance as far as the state? And you may not be able to take a stance on it, but what about stocking bait? It's a waste whether, of time. whether it be... At Lake Norman? Yeah. It's a waste of time. Um, Expound, please. Yeah, sure. Because, once again, we are dealing with the nutrient load. And what do those? What does that bait feed off of? That bait feeds off of that nutrients. Plankton. So, so if you're... I wish we could access this, but anyway. Uh, I, well, um, that, no, it's fine. I'll play and see what no, I no, can no, do. No, 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 no. Don't, don't worry about it. I, I can do it this way. So, say, say this is your ball of nutrients down at the bottom of the lake that all your microorganisms feed off of, right? All your plankton and all that feed off of this nutrients. I mean, this is a very simplistic way of looking at it. It's a big, massive Well, way. I mean, we need it simple so everybody but, can understand. But you got this ball of nutrients. And say this is Lake Norman's nutrient ball. It's about this size, right? It's going to grow a ball about this size of whatever. Thread fins, alewife, bluegill, whatever that is. Well, alewives... I'm, well, you may be for them, but I'm just going to tell you, that's the dumbest bait source that was ever brought in here. Well, I'm not going to say that I'm with it. So, I mean, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, they don't belong. They're another, it's invasive. Another it's a, it's invasive. invasive. Another invasive. So, Which was, so, once again, brought by striper fishermen. So, yes, it was. So, <laughs> if, well, if, if you have a ball this big of, of nutrients and then you got a ball this big of bait, it doesn't matter what you stop. That's and your ball of bait. So, so let's. No matter if it's more alewife or if it's more threadfin or whatever it is, that's your ball of bait right there. And and so that brings me to several things that people are saying. I'll be the bad guy and ask it. So if it's a waste of time to stock bait because the lake doesn't have the nutrients to support I know where it, you're going. <laughs> why are we? Is it a waste of time to stock F ones? Mike Langford, Michael Fox, Lisa Snyder May, and all of you. Don't shoot me. I'm asking questions so that so everybody here, can hear the here answer. Here is the difference. What we're trying to do is basically replace the current largemouth with those F1s. So when I, if you remember, you can go back and pr- and review the tape. More aggressive, I, more sustainable. There you go. More okay. aggressive, get bigger, all those things, and and hopefully, so just because you stock a fish, for instance. 
Say say we stock hybrids, hybrid striped bass. Don't bring that up. Because there's a lot of people talking about well, that. I, I know. But say that's what we stock. <laughs> yep. That doesn't necessarily mean that their piece of pie gets bigger. It could. And somebody else's piece of pie gets smaller. Because it's a big pie. That pasture land is one big pie. But where the pie really doesn't change is the nutrients really don't change. And the group that's just above it, which are like the bluegills, the, the, the shads, all those things that feed on that nutrient load, they really that piece of pie stays the same. It might, like I said, it might get chopped up in different sections year to year. It changes year to year. But then that bigger piece of pie that's above it, those all those predators, crappy, catfish of every species you, you can name, hybrid striped bass, largemouth, Alabama bass, I'm probably missing some. White perch, white percher. That, the white perch are the biggest detriment of the Catawba chain ever. No doubt. But, but, but that's so another topic. That's another piece of pie that's feeding on that piece of pie that's in the middle, right? Mm-hmm. And so if we stop F1s over here, we may take a little bit of the pie away from hybrid striped bass or a little bit of the pie away from Alabama bass or a little bit of pie away from white perch or we might not do anything. That's why it's an experiment. We don't know the answer to that. But the... To say we can't stock anything because it's just a waste of time, period, that's not what I'm getting at. We can go and stock alewives till we're blue in the face. But we're not going to change the number of fish that's able to be eaten by predators by doing that. We might change the composition of the fish. So, And so that's really where we're at with the F1s. We're trying to change the composition. Maybe we add a few more largemouth, but we also change the composition of the largemouth. That they might grow faster. They might get bigger. They might be more aggressive, as he said, you know, in biting. That's really what we're shooting for. Is trying to, basically it's an augmentation is probably the right word of the largemouth bass population. This is probably not going to change anything when it comes to Alabama bass, hybrid striped bass, white perch. Any of that. It so, probably won't change any of it. So, again, recap a little bit. And I know it's hard for everybody to understand that. Es- essentially, you're talking about Shane Lineberger sitting at Thanksgiving table with a handful of guys Kyle's size, and there's one pie. Who's going to get the most of that pie? The reality is that Shane is. He's a bigger guy. Nah, but technically what he's saying is the aggressive person. And and that's where okay, Mark Sil- would be the large mouth. I would be the spotted bass. Mark Silverthorne is he brought up if the large mouth don't thrive, then now why would F ones? You stated why they may thrive is because they're more aggressive than that's the exactly large right. mouth we have. That's period. Exactly right. End of story. No other comments to be made is they are more aggressive. It is an experiment. Give it time to work. If you want to, and I can't sit here and guarantee. That it that it's going to do what we hope it to do. I can't do that. That's science. No, no, it's it's an experiment. You know, yeah, people no, need science. to understand that if you donate to this cause, kudos to you for doing it. But you are donating to an experiment to learn what the potential is. You know what? Five years from now, everybody may say, you know what? Enough of this. We're going to try to manage spotted bass and make spotted bass the best it can be, and try to compete with Lanier as a spotted bass fishery. We don't know. And and I will tell you that it's no matter what the species of fish you name it at Lake Norman, it is an uphill battle. No matter what it is, whether that be spotted bass, whether that be whatever it is, it is a tough place. I say it over and over again. It is how, a tough place for fish to grow. How effective would it be since there's a didn't the state reduce the the size limit on? Creel limit, size limit on spots? No, uh, there is no creel limit. There is no creel limit. No so, size limit. If you how, catch 2,000 of them, take them on with you. How effective would it be for somebody to host a, a poundage tournament? If they're wanting to do something, say, 14, 15-inch spotted bass or less, just do a poundage tournament. So, it's just... I, I, would that reduce the mouths of feed and maybe, help it? Maybe. So, or I, would it take years to, to do? Well, it's going to take years, period. Bi- biology doesn't happen... Overnight. Overnight. There is, right. there, is there, is there is no, no immediate overnight. fix. There is no immediate fix. There is no overnight. People got to understand that this is not, in our culture today, we are all about the quick satisfaction, and that does not work in the biological world at all. Right. So what it would take for, and, and this is to potentially, 
potentially sure. make spotted bass better in the lake is, yes, a thinning of the herd. And it would have to be a consistent thinning of the herd by anglers. There's nothing we can do as an agency to thin the herd enough. We just, yep. you guys put your hands on more fish as a group, not individuals, but as a group than we do. For think, sure. You think Dave Anderson could eat that many spotted bass? He'd try. But, <laughs> but, so when I say that, but here's the caveat to that. You can thin the herd of spotted bass, and that may or may not make spotted bass bigger. Because here's the caveat. White perch could come in and take up those nutrients and yep. those fish. I mean, yep. there could be that, another. That's, yeah. that's the problem. You don't know what the next player is you because don't. it's biology, and you can't say to a and white perch, you can't spawn this unfortunately, year. Unfortunately, unfortunately, Lake Norman, we it is a melting pot. We have added, and when I say so we, much. people have added so much to the fishery. It is so dynamic, and there's so many things doing this to each other. That it is very, very problematic. To say, I mean, I can't sit here and say if we thin the spotted bass herd. Now, do I think it could help? Absolutely. If you do nothing, I know where we are. We are where we are. Right. Yeah. Right? Yep. Prob- you, probably going downhill. Yeah. If you thin the herd, they're more than likely because they are a schooling fish, you will thin the herd where they get bigger. You know, because there's less spotted bass near each other. That's right. And so they will feed better and get bigger. And so you probably will see better spotted bass, but I can't guarantee that. All right, now so, let, well, hold on a minute. Because spotted bass and white perch, they like this on the lake. I mean, now, you find a spotted bass, you're gonna find a white. You're perch. right. Now let me ask you this: This has always been my question. All right, we're talking about thinning the herd here. If we're gonna thin the herd on spotted bass, hey, don't clap so loud. I'm I, I doing clap them. I'm just you. Be quiet. Okay. <laughs> All right. If we're gonna thin the herd on a spotted bass, which is and like I told you before, if they're under 15 inches, I'm all for it. I'll help you. All right. Why do we continually want to thin the herd on spotted bass? Then we're going to turn around and stock it full of hybrids. What have, what have we accomplished? Stock it full of hybrids. What are have we, we accomplished? Are we talking about hybrid stripe bass? We are. Yes. Okay, so. What have we accomplished? Once again, um, I got to wear it. A bunch of hats here. I understand. Okay, so I'm just going. But you're the guy to ask. Well, maybe. Kind of put not. you on the spot. But. No, that's fine. Dude. You don't put me on the spot. I, I warned. No, I warned him this was you're coming. You're not gonna hurt my feelings. Trust I don't want to hurt I'm your a, feelings. I'm a thick-skinned guy. You know, I don't want to hurt your feelings. As Kyle says, I don't um, have feelings. <laughs> um, what I would tell you is, is that one, obviously, there are more anglers than just bass anglers. Okay, first I understand time. So that. There's a, there's a big contingency at the lake that like the hybrid striped bass, so that program's going to continue. Um, you know, what I would say is, is that the harvest rate of hybrids at the lake, they don't stay there very long. And we've done lots and lots of work on those guys. I know you Uh, have. They don't, they don't make it past age four. Spotted bass? No, hybrids. Oh, hybrids. Okay. Don't make it past age four. I know you did the thing with tagging them uh, and all that. They, I was they, I was a good recipient of they, a couple of them hundred dollar checks. They are literally. <laughs> they are literally it, the the harvest rate is probably somewhere we haven't crunched the numbers because the program just ended today. The, um, the 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 orange tags. Okay. Just ended today. Um, we're probably looking somewhere between sixty and eighty percent annual harvest of hybrids. And that's like a crappy fishery, to give you some kind of idea. Crappy fishermen, fishermen are going out, taking them home, eating them. No. And that's exactly what's happening to hybrids. So when you say, do we keep stocking hybrids? Well, yes, and yes, they do take up nutrients, and yes, they do eat fish, and I get all that. But they're not the main player on the lake. The main players on the lake are the ones that have the largest biomass, and that's white perch and spotted bass. They're the main players. So, the, 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 if you could have shown my little thing that I made today, mm-hmm. Like white perch is this big group of fish, Absolutely. and spotted bass are this big group yep. of fish, and then catfish are kind of over here. Hybrids are kind of. over Are you here. okay with making the PowerPoint sure. public? Yeah, we we okay. will post yeah, the PowerPoint yeah. for you guys to view yeah, there after. Be, there won't really be an explanation of that slide. Is it something I made off the cuff? It was, is that of, that child drawing you were talking about? The child drawing. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. It looks like I did it in crayon. Um, but you'll get an idea of kind of. If you look at it, it'll show you the nutrients at the bottom and then what kind of feeds off of those nutrients and then what feeds off of those things. Mm-hmm. And and I kind of put it in proportion that there's, you know, 
the main two players of biomass on the lake right now in terms of predators is white perch and spotted bass. Yeah, the white perch are, I mean, they're, they're we, we've been out there before and, and you catch two or three hundred of them. And the same thing, you know, you know, can thinning of the herd help them? Maybe, maybe not. Highly likely, highly unlikely that that would that would help them because. And here's the reason why: they reproduce like rabbits. I mean, they are very good at reproduction. Do you That's do why white them? bass don't exist anymore because yeah. they have run them out of town. Yeah. You know, do you everybody do remembers them? 30 years ago white bass being on the lake, especially especially on Wiley. Yep. You know that was kind of the thing back in back when I was coming up. You went to Wiley and caught three pound white bass after three pound white bass, yep. and it was just unbelievable. And it's it's no more. It's and it's history. and it's truly, other than a few places in the state of North Carolina, white bass don't exist anymore. They're gone, and it's because invasives were stocked, which were white perch. Invasives were stocked, and boom. That's why I don't want to protect an invasive. It's because, I, you know, I've said this to other people. I've said this to other groups. I've said this at the national level and at the southeastern level in the state of North Carolina. 20 years from now, black bass, which includes smallmouth, largemouth, spotted bass, Alabama bass, those are the species of, in that group of family, will look totally different in North Carolina than it does right now and particularly what it looked like 20 years ago because of the introduction of the Alabama bass. We're talking about a substantial change <laughs> of fisheries across the state. And it's already happened in practically two-thirds of the state at some level. And you name the lake, it's probably already occurring there today. Now, do the, the lakes, the, the the Triangle Region lakes, do they have white perch? They do, but... They have fish big enough to eat the white no, perch. No, they do that. Here's the thing, here's the thing about the white perch there. The white perch were not brought in there. The white perch were already there when the when those lakes... Those lakes are pretty young. And those lakes were dammed in the 80s. 80s, yeah. You know, Sharon Harris might have been earlier than that, maybe, but it was sometime in that general time frame of those three lakes around the triangles. But white perch were, were native, basically, to those rivers at the time. And so it seems to be something about white perch growing up in those systems. Like, we still have white bass there today in Jordan and in Falls. White bass still exist there and coexist with white, with white perch. But when you bring white perch in... To a system where white perch were not there, it seems to be the death. Why? We don't, I mean, we know the mechanisms that they get rid of them, but why bringing them in instead of growing up with them is a difference. I don't know. Did they used to have a high rock? What? Perch? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're all in the Yadkin in the Yadkin like I thought that's where, I, yeah, I thought yeah, that's where they were. They called them, uh, particularly in the York, lower Yadkin, they call them walkamalls. Yep. That's what they call them. Yep. So they've been there, they've been so, there a while. So curiosity question, there, somebody made a comment about it. If, I don't know anymore. I'm out of my mind. You're, <laughs> you're, 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 you're over the top and we've blown your mind. And you know what? You got, everybody's watching, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this has kind of cleared up some fuzzy areas for people because you did you guys had your meeting and that was put on live but north carolina hasn't had a platform to say hey here's what we're doing here's why we're doing it here's everything else yeah. it's all what fishermen say on facebook and that's where yeah. we're getting our news from and and that's our fault uh, I mean, but honestly, it, it, we've we've created a vacuum that we needed to fill, and we're trying to fill it with information. Well, and, and now, and now, you're gonna, you're probably gonna be back on. I'm just gonna tell you that now. <laughs> I know you're probably dreading it. You may no, not want any part of it. Dude, but, you're fine. You're fine. I'm, um, I'm fine. Is and I may be dead wrong on this, but if you kill, say, five hundred thousand white perch, are they like coyotes in the sense that? The more you kill, the more they reproduce? Or do you not have the data we don't to have answer the, that? We don't have the data to know that. What I can tell you is that a sexually mature white perch is four inches long. So think about that at Lake Norman. Yeah, there's lots that's like there's all of them. That's like a lot of four inches. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's like all of lots of those. <laughs> there's lots of those. So, they, so what they do is they, they typically reproduce very early. In their life cycle, they don't live super long, but they they reproduce. They they become sexually mature really early in their life, and that makes them great invaders. That really makes them a great invader. I'll give you an example of 
an invasive fish, it's not white perch, but an invasive fish where, where a state agency tried to control the fish and what it did to them. And that's flathead catfish in Georgia. They went out and decided on the Satilla River, we're going to go out and we're going to have a crew and all they do is harvest flathead catfish because we're trying to create, we're trying to keep our sunfish fishery because flatheads love sunfish. That's like one of their favorite things to eat. And zoom old monster worms. And, <laughs> and, chat, <laughs> and chatterbaits. And eels and you name it. They, 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 they'll eat a jig and spoon. They'll eat just about anything. But anyway, so they went out and did this, and they're still doing it for years. They've been doing it. And what they found is that what they're doing is making those fish mature, sexually mature earlier. Stop at, saying that because we got some children on here that are taking that down a road that well, we're not looking to I go. can't help what road they take. But, I know. But <laughs> instead of it being a very large fish that becomes sexually mature, the fish are smaller in size. So to answer that question, I don't know if that would happen in white perch. If they did, they would, they're already super small when they're sexually mature. Yeah. So it could happen, but my guess is... But here's the thing about harvesting and about particularly with an invasive. So white perch or spotted bass. You take your foot off the pedal. Something else is going to take over. No, no. You take no, your they're foot just off gonna, the pedal. They're just going to come right back. They flood right back. Yeah. So, you know, the harvest thing is a great thing, but it's something that we would have to be very consistent with in order to make it happen, uh, in order to make a difference. All right. So the, the next elephant in the room, Matt Haywood, thank you for asking this because I was going there next is what do you think the survival rate is going to be when you go from F1s that are 6 to 9 inches and drop down to fingerlings? And do you have to keep restocking them? And to keep an F1, yes. We'll have to restock every year. Absolutely. It's just like the hybrid striped bass. They're hybrids. So, And in order to keep the 50-50 F1 in the population, you know, so for instance, if we stock F1s this spring and we don't do it again, those F1s that survive will live out their life, say, 10 to 15 years from now, we won't have F1s anymore if we stop stocking. Yep. So so, so we would have to keep stocking F1s. What was your question again? Back to you said something. Okay. The, the, well, I got two now. You just brought up something else. But okay. um, the survival rate for the F1s so, against so, the spots, the hybrids. So obviously, as a the smaller rate. the fish, the smaller the fish, the, the less less survival we're going to get. Generally, I tell people, depending on the species and depending on what they do and where they go and all those kinds of things, you're probably looking at, in the first year, you're looking at 10 to 30% that survive. Okay? It's a tough world out there. Yeah. Dog eat dog. It is. So, and that's true of fish that naturally reproduce. It's probably 10 to 30% that survive every year. So, we're not really doing anything real different. Stock fish... Sometimes, depending on the species, and, and the jury's out about F1s, sometimes do better than a naturally reproduced fish, and sometimes they do worse. So we don't know that either. Well, let me ask you this. I know, you know, most of the, the fingerling stocking I've seen, they back a truck up to a boat ramp, pull a, pull a chute, and there to go. Yep. All right, now, why not do this? Instead of backing it up and doing that, i fished tournaments in Alabama before where – they give everybody in the it's in the tournament. They give you a bag of fingerlings, yep, to put in your live well that morning wherever you run to, wherever your first stop is. And that's that's what we're going to do with dump the them F1s. in. Okay, that's good. That's what we'll do with the good. F1s. Good, because you know, and that's you, what if, we did with these F ones that yeah. just got stocked. Is we moved them to to locations that right. we thought would be better, good, um, than than just you know pulling the shoot on them. Yep, because um, I, I just I think this just pulling up to the ramp and you know dumping a I'm just gonna now, use. I'm just gonna use a that, number. I don't know the number. Now, just dumping a hundred thousand of them in the end of at Pinnacle. You know, you're all you're doing is gonna start a feeding frenzy. But what I what I would <laughs> what I would say is that you know everybody holds up uh, Smith Mountain as the as the golden whatever the golden trophy goose child. the trophy child here. They back up to the boat ramp and pull the plug. If they don't have spotted bass, that's true. They don't have spotted bass. They got two. Major rivers that flow into I, it. I, I'm, you know, it, deep it's water. Totally different system. Yeah, yeah so, it is. It's a different animal. I mean, it's a different so animal. We've compare, all had the same argument, so for, people. So yeah. for us to compare Norman and and Smith Mountain I, is, totally in my different. opinion, they're totally different. 
Well, honestly, Norman and Mount Mallon are totally different. Even though they look the same and act, act somewhat similar, they're actually totally different lakes. They're just, there's just differences going on that we don't even see or know. You know, so to compare, we can kind of compare lake to lake at some at some level, but to say this one's going to act exactly like this one, because yeah. Mount Allen's a desert. I mean, for the most part. I so, mean, you know. so to recap this, Michael Kennard, the state can grow all the bait fish they want. The reality <laughs> of it is, is there's not enough nutrients to support bait fish. The whole point of the stocking... And, not, and we wouldn't stock L.Y. for bluebacks. We would stock thread fins. And we can grow thread fins See, and stock them. W- but why not blue... I'm just... Again, for, It's an invasive fish. We're blue not... Bluebacks are invasive. It, they're invasive to the Catawba yeah, drainage blue, to blue, that blue, part of the... Because blue blue they're not native and blue you guys are a saltwater fish. They're, they're an oceanic fish that runs up our coastal rivers in the to spring spawn. of the year to spawn. And yep. then they go back out in the ocean. So they are not an inland water fish. On top of that... They can be very detrimental to certain species of fish, such as walleye. They were very detrimental to the striped bass population at Lake Norman because... Be, well, because of the fact that... They went deep, and the stripers went deep, and now it went belly up. But so, was it the bluebacks that did that, or was it the alewives? It's alewives. It's a predominantly alewife fishery. There are bluebacks and, there. And so, can I just ask another question, because you're a biologist, and... I probably don't know the answer if it's different between <laughs> bluebacks and alewives. Oh, well, I, okay, then maybe I don't... Well, go ahead and ask it. Alewives, when they're chased, they go as deep as they can go. Yep. Bluebacks, when they're chased, go as high as they can get. They still prefer cooler water than like a threadfin shad prefer. Okay. Um, so I'm not saying that alewife and blueback are exactly the same. They're pretty close. Um, but they don't... Like a threadfin shad is not going to prefer cold water at all. Because cold no, water they kills them. They, they, kill they, they croak right. in cold water. That's right. So, which makes you know, which was what made Wiley good in the wintertime that before the alewives kind of. But once the alewives get introduced, particularly in that summertime when oxygen in all these reservoirs gets low, down deep, those alewives go down deep and that's where they stay. And that's where the predators go because that's where the bait is. And then they get trapped and they die of so, basically suffocate to death. Yeah. Chris Marshall wants to know why. If that's the case, then why is every blueback lake so good? Murray, Hartwell, Clark Hill. Smith Mountain. Smith. <laughs> you do bring up a valid point, Shane. <laughs> totally. I, I, I can't answer that. You, ha- you have no... We, we got a question you didn't have an answer to, guys. Well, I probably uh, could sit and... We could pontificate on that forever, but... No, I mean... Once again... again you got to have we're data. Trying, we're trying... Yeah, I don't have data for that. And we're also trying to compare apples to oranges with Norman and a Murray. Norman yeah. and a Smith Mountain. You Norman can't do and, that. You can't. It's just apples to oranges. To say, well, if we don't do nothing but stock a bunch of bluebacks in the lake, we're going to make fishing 100% better at Norman. No, we're not. It's still <laughs> the... It doesn't matter if they're eating bluebacks or eating threadfin at, at, at a big... At, at a level... There's still only a certain amount of bluebacks. If it was 100% bluebacks, there's only a certain amount of bluebacks that are in Norman. If it was 100% threadfin, there's only a certain amount of threadfin that would be in Norman. And that it would be the same amount no matter what the species is. Does that make sense? Yeah, and so we all circle back to nutrients. Yep. There, that's, that, that's the thing. That it, is the, it is the driving force at Lake Norman. Well, it's the driving force at every lake. Every lake starts with nutrients. The more you have, the more fish you grow. So, and t- the bigger fish you grow. Let's let's fire a different lake out there. We're right here, kind of on the shores of Lake Wiley. You got South Fork River that back in the day had textile mills that dumped all kinds of yep. things that it, you yeah. don't even want to speak of. Yep. It'd you be got, green one day, orange one day, <laughs> blue. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then and then then you have. There are still houses on Lake Wild that dump their sewer into the lake. They are grandfathered in and are allowed to do it. As those places get cleaned up and go away, South Fork, there's no textile mills left there that I know of to speak of. And as people move uh, on the South Fork. Uh, Parkdale, far, Parkdale far Mills, Far Yarns is still on there. But they're not putting... I'm sure that they're not. They're, they're not putting the, the goody back into and the lake all, like they used and, to. And, and really, as the South Fork changes, as people move west... Of Charlotte, because that's what's happening. That's oh, yeah. west of Charlotte, and yeah. I mean, all you gotta do is look at the western half of Lake Norman right now. I mean, it, 
That's there's where a subdivision I, uh, going every that's every where, 500 feet. There's yeah, houses, you know? that's where I live, and it's and so the it's coming to me in a hurry, and I don't want yep, it to. <laughs> the landscape is changing, and so yeah, in 30, 40 years, Lake Wiley might be a lot clearer than it is now. I mean, honestly, it very well could be because how that landscape is changing in that watershed. So I don't know if that was your question. I no, it it, it is bit. no, it's it's perfect because I got one guy asking about Wiley and what the forecast for Wiley is, and the reality of it is, this is what's coming, whether we like if, it or not. And if you clear up, it, any if, fishery that gets clear, if you, gonna, if you clear up and you got Alabamas, look out. Yeah, and that's <laughs> that's all I know to say. That, no, that that's and, right. And so that that goes back to. And I know I'm harping on it, but that goes back to why we don't want to move fish and move invasive fish. Because we're talking about a place in Lake Wiley that hosted the Bassmaster Classic. 2006. Was it back-to-back? Was it two years? No. It was 2004 just... was uh, the Classic out here. Was, was it that, four? It was 2004. I can't remember. I knew it. it, it yeah. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. I knew but it. it. Five pounds up. So we had a Bassmaster's Classic on Lake Wiley. Would you say that Lake Wiley is a Bassmaster's Classic Lake today? Right now, no. Heck no. No, you're lucky if you catch more than 11 pounds out here. Exactly. And what's but, ha- but what's but, changed? But, okay, and, and again, I'm going to get crucified for saying this. But I, the fishing industry but, has changed from I'm, weights to which... I was getting ready to Commission say pays the, the biggest purse. I was getting ready to say, dude, I'm, I fish the Bassmasters, and I'm going to tell you right now, they don't care about that. All they care about is... <laughs> it's money. It, it's it's money. It, it comes down to money. They go where the I, money goes. I understand but, that, but but really to to sum up Lake Wiley, the spots are becoming a problem. Okay, all the predominantly big largemouth piers on this lake, you go to and you flip a jig under it, man, nine times out of ten you're gonna catch a spot. There are those magical days where, oh no, I got a four pound largemouth. What do I, what do I do now? I got to get him in a boat. Okay, <laughs> that 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 still happens, but. I think really and truly what's changed widely more than anything is your bait source has changed. Okay? The spots have come in and forced the largemouth off of all the rocky stuff on the main channel and all the flat sandy stuff on the main channel. So now they suspend. Are, is there a problem with the largemouth population? Yeah, there is. I, I, I would agree to that. There is a problem. Are they all dead? No. Is, is, are there those magical days where you can still catch 20 pounds out there? Yeah. It happened at Norman in February. It happened out here. Three weekends in a row, we had 20-pound bags in the spring when we weren't supposed to be fishing tournaments, but we did it anyway. But that, So that goes back to my statement of 20 years from now, the landscape of black bass in North Carolina will have changed significantly because of this one fish being introduced at Lake Norman. Oh, it is. And the spread that came from that. That's... That's the part that, as a biologist, concerns me greatly because I don't know how to turn it around because we don't have the answer. As, as one of my biologist buddies that works with me, he says all the time, we're not going to stock our way out of Alabama bass. They're here. So how Can do you we... eat your way out of them? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I don't... I, you know, it, it's perplexing for us as biologists because... You know, we really haven't seen in the black bass world, we haven't seen uh, this type of invasive movement of black bass. Like, you know, smallmouth were stocked years ago in places that they didn't exist. You know, like Lake James. They didn't exist in Lake James. Well, maybe they did, but it was iffy. And, you know, they didn't take over. But Alabama bass have, have done a fine job of taking over. They know what they're doing. I mean, well, but, and, and, and to speak to that even more, if you go south of here, you go into places like parts of Georgia, parts of South Carolina that have black bass species that are basically endemic. And that word means they basically are from that general little area. And I can't think of their names right now. Um, Shoal bass comes to mind, but it might not be shoal bass. But it's it's some of those black bass species that are not as well known as as other as as say a largemouth is. Mm-hmm. Because of the movement of Alabama bass into those drainages, we're talking about black bass. People fish that people catch. Maybe twenty years from now, we're talking about being on the Endangered Species Act. Seriously, 
that there are certain species because they are so localized and they're only found in one part of the world that because of that introduction and the the integra integration of Alabama bass that some of these fish are not going to exist on the planet anymore because of that. I, I'll tell you one thing I noticed. You talk about that. Back before Hartwell had an explosion of spotted bass, you used to catch a lot of little bass in there and they were red-eye bass. Yep. And they're they, gone. They're gone. I, I mean, you can go to Lake Chatoug. Lake Chatoug used to be a premier smallmouth bass fishery. Does not exist. Gone. Gone because of Alabama bass. So, and that's what's going to happen at Lake Fontana. That's what's going to happen at Lake James. And because if you look at if you look at Lake Chatoug, that was that's a thirty year invasion. Fontana's probably in that ten year invasion right now, and James is about at, at year six or seven. And what you're seeing is Chatoug, smallmouth don't exist. Fontana, which is a little bit younger but older than the James invasion. They're pretty much either mean mouths, very few smallmouth, or all Alabamas. You go to James, there's still smallmouth there, but there's a lot of mean mouths there. Yeah, there and are. So you see this progression. And, and so when we're talking about moving this fish around and protecting spotted bass and all that, and I know it, every case is different, it becomes real problematic for black bass as, as a whole group, such as largemouth and smallmouth and red eyes which we did have red eyes in western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Gone. I so, mean, so it's just... Red eyes the same be, as a rock bass? No, that's a... Mm -hmm. Rock bass are not black bass. Okay. okay. Rock bass are basically a sunfish. Yeah, I was going to say... And we anyway. I don't want to get down in that world. But I, <laughs> I'm a so, Anderson Tran, I want you to know, I'm not ignoring your questions because they are valid questions, and you've stated three different things that need to be covered. I'm going to try to scroll up here and catch the first one. I know Anderson. You know Anderson? Mm -hmm. Okay. So he wants to know, I think that's the first one. That's as far back as I can what go. What is the point in trying? No. no. What, what can we do to improve the largemouth ability to compete slash grow? Is it habitat? He wants to know, practically, practically speaking, what actions can anglers take to improve the factors that you... I mean, habitat is very important to largemouth, as y'all know. I don't have to tell you that. And and largemouth habitat at Norman is not fantastic, let's be honest. Virtually but especially offshore. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you think about 20, 30 years ago, you know, there were islands, button bushes. You know, there were there were different habitats that don't exist, basically, mm -hmm. now at Lake Norman. Um, you know, can we establish habitat in those upper reaches where there aren't houses or if there are landowners that will let us establish habitat, can we do that? We can certainly try to do that. And do I think it'll help largemouth? For sure. Um, but like I said, that's an uphill battle. I don't want to wait on stocking until we got that nailed down because I think we I'll be retired. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so. Well, I mean, but again, here's we're... I'm doing I'm I'm doing this what I'm trying to do between Lake Wiley and South Carolina for the fisheries and you know what these guys are trying they're not doing it for them because I think I think the people that have enough sense to realize that this is a long term thing you know we're not gonna fix it tomorrow but sure. we'll, we could potentially change it for our kids Kyle's got young kids Shane you got a daughter who's 15 who will fish but doesn't care right well, let's face it and i've got young kids for me what are we gonna do to make it better for them yeah i mean that's that's the point uh michael Kennard. so you think that if there's no nutrients you need to consistently add bait fish that costs money sir and i think that if <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know what he's asking. He's saying with Norman being what it is, being nutrient void. Oh, it, it, you put bait fish in every. It doesn't. We can't grow enough. That, that's you can't grow enough, and we could literally grow bait fish in every hatchery we own and stock them all in Lake Norman, and it would be this big pulse. But then we'd have to do it all over again. We wouldn't grow anything else. I mean, and, and honestly, it, it takes a lot of. It's hard to grow bait fish, believe it or not. They're not one because they get crushed by birds and yeah. everything in the hat. I mean, you got to think about it. in the so, hatcheries, they're pinned up, you know. So, um, so they're not the easiest thing to grow. Um, but 
there's just it's on a scale that people can't fathom in their brain. We're talking millions upon millions of fish to make a difference. And if you put them out there and there's no nutrients for them to feed off of, they if they don't get gobbled up, they're uh, pretty much going to die. Once so, again, it goes down to that ball. How big's that ball at the bottom? If that ball's real big, like at a Jordan Lake, mm-hmm. you got a lot of fish. You can grow big fish everywhere of all different species. You can grow big fish. But when your ball is small of nutrients, you just you just don't have enough you don't have enough at the bottom to sustain what's above you. And you can't add I know that's hard for people to think, well, we can't do anything about nutrients. Well, we can't do anything about <laughs> nutrients. I don't know how to be any clearer about that. There's just you know, unless y'all want to, you know, uh, tell tell the city of uh, Cornelius or something like that, that that you don't want them to treat their wastewater anymore and just dump raw <laughs> sewage into the lake, which I don't think I mean, I'm not going to advocate for that. Well, but if y'all want to advocate for that, <laughs> no, fine, not so me. Be. I'll, I, well, I'll bring I'll bring up a valid point now. How much it happens at Lake Norman, I don't know, but I know at Wiley, when I first started fishing, they they ran water through the lake differently than they do today. I understand there's a FERC agreement. And I understand there's all these regulations they have to abide by. What, and you you probably, you may not know the answer, but if Wiley would stayed muddy as much as it used to, mm-hmm. that made the lake a lot better. I mean, it, it mud creates nutrients, it's which nu- creates... Well, it is nutrients. Mud is the nutrients. So, so, that, so when you get muddy water... That is nutrients flowing into your lake. So, like, for instance, right now, Lake Norman's getting a big pulse of nutrients, right? Yeah, it is filthy. And somebody says, well, what if we kept it muddy, or, you know, what if we had that all the time? Yeah, it would grow more fish, and for better, sure. And better fish. It would grow bigger fish and more fish, but you're not going to get that with Norman. You'd have uh, a lot of teed off homeowners, well, too. Well, even... In, well, some of that's out of their control. They can't really control the well, nutrient flow that's coming into the lake. But when, well, where I was going with Duke Energy, so when I first started fishing, the lake kind of maintained a level. And you look at the graph. The data is out there to go back and look at. The, the lake level was 97, and we'd get rain, and the lake level would spike, and then it would flow back down gradually. Mm-hmm. Now, there's rain on the forecast. They dropped the bottom out of this place. Literally dropped the bottom out of it. Part of that, and then let it fill back so up. So part of that is their is their FERC license. Yep. Um. It, that's and that's uh. We won't get into that. That is a huge process. That's a that's, that a that's a deep hole. It's a deep hole that we don't need to get into. So part of that is what they do, and they're preparing because there are so many people that live on the lakes now. They are making preparations to not flood those people, and 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 it's it, it becomes a safety thing for them. Well, I know at Mountain you know, Island and the upper end here, especially, yeah. there, there are flood problems. Yeah, and so it's a safety issue as well when it comes to people's homes and and people's livelihoods, businesses that are on the lake. So they're trying not to flood those as well. But all that's wrapped up in a FERC license that we don't really have any control over for the next forty plus years. You know, these FERC licenses are fairly new and they last. 50 years yeah so you know but I, that's really not what's driving nutrients on the lake in fact i saw a comment by a gentleman his name uh is dave ferguson he made a comment that you know it's going to get water quality on our lakes is going to improve year after year after year after year because our technology has improved how we manage wastewater Can and we how go we back manage to being stormwater dumb? And how we manage all those things, we've gotten so much better at. And so, yes, he's exactly right. That production is going to lessen over time. Um, so, in theory, Norman could get less productive than it is now. And so, Wiley can get less productive. And, you know, and you're already seeing some of that. Well, so, there, there's so many other things, too, that we're seeing. There's... There's new waterfront property in the back of Crowder's Creek that wasn't here 10 years ago. Yeah. I it's, mean, it, it's the, the sanitation. Just like, you know, I have to deal with, you know, people moving in from all over into the state of North Carolina. The landscape of our state is changing. The amount of people that are living here, the number of people that are on these lakes are changing. And our technology is just getting better. And so we're getting better at cleaning the water that we're, that we're utilizing. Because, yeah. It's a body, Lake Norman's a body of water, but people are using it for all different types of things, including drinking it. 
So, <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it, that's that is a fact. But yeah. what people are shortchanging themselves on is the amount of dollars that our natural resources can bring in to our state's economies. It's a inland fishing. I wish I had that number off the top of my head. I know what it is in South Carolina. What is it in South Carolina? The the fishing industry as a whole brings in three point nine billion dollars. It's pretty in close revenue. to that in North Carolina. It's almost it's somewhere in that three to five billion dollar so, range. So so yeah. if you have And that, that's just that's just inland fishing. That doesn't include the salt water I'm, a, I'm aware, but yeah. we're not utilizing the money that we're bringing in. Let's face it. We as fishermen bring this money in, whether it be through tournaments, tackle sales, manufacturing, whatever. We're doing it. We're doing our part, but we're not smart enough to fight for those dollars. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I mean, like I said, a united voice is much better than a divided voice. So and if I could suggest anything to you, you know, whether it be whatever, if it's habitat at Lake Norman or whatever, you know, a united voice will help you for sure. Hint, hint, boys and girls, let's all get on the same page and quit <laughs> all being biologists and thinking that each one of us knows better than and, the other and work as a team to get what we want. And, and I will tell you that, you know, as an agency, we're here to represent you all that you pay our bills. We represent y'all. Now, we represent all fishermen. We don't re just represent bass fishermen. <laughs> That's the we, only kind of fishermen. But, we, but we represent <laughs> all fishermen. And so I appreciate, you know, obviously I appreciate the opportunity to come speak to y'all because forever I think we've been somewhat, uh, when I say we, I mean the commission, it's been hard to get an avenue to talk to bass anglers. It just has. Well, and but it's there's... something that I've strived for for many, many years. And so... You know, I want that dialogue open. You're not going to say anything that's going to upset me or get me riled up. I mean, we can agree to disagree. You know, he wants to save every spot, and I want to kill every spot. No, I'm, no, just, save I'm, them just, all. I'm just kidding. I'm just, just the kidding. ones that just the ones that are two just, pounds and bigger. I just said that to drive you crazy. <laughs> well, no, it don't I mean, drive but, me but, crazy. But the point of it is, is really, you know what? Either support the F1 experiment or choose not to fund it, but don't sit and criticize it because. It's an experiment. It's just that. <laughs> you have to give it time to work. <laughs> Shane Lieber is hard fishing for life. He probably needs to. Uh, Randy Hilliard, that is going to be uh, on the future episodes, sir. Stick around. You'll like that one. Um, yeah, Jason Land, you're right. You want nutrients, but mm, you can't just magically create those. Nope. And we, we we are where we are with we need that. them deviled eggs. De <laughs> need them deviled eggs. I'll tell you how we can. Well, I can't publicly say how we can create it. Just fishermen, pack plenty of toilet paper in your boat when you go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not advising that, but whatever. <laughs> Look, Chris, Chris Marshall's poor mouth, and I'd love to stop driving two or three hours down the road to fish all North Carolina lakes. Yeah, it is such a shame. <laughs> making money at Lake Murray. Yeah. I'd feel so bad if I was him beating up on Joey all the time. You know <laughs> You know what's bad is I talked to Jody Wright the night before that tournament. Or yeah, it was the night before that tournament. And uh he was poor mouthing about the bites they were getting and Joey Sabaga posted one lowly fish like a ten pound or something on Facebook and had them yeah. all gun shy and they go down there and crack his head. Joey, I'm 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 ashamed, sir. We're still trying to get the YouTube video from the, the Chris website. Marshall. I'm proud of you, buddy. All right, I don't even know what that's all about. Um, a Lorganite everywhere. You yeah, know what a is. I have no idea. It's human waste. It's a fertilizer. Turning. It's turning human waste. We use it in the landscape industry. Yeah, there you Make go. Make stuff grow. There you go. A grass car for invasive. <laughs> My, Michael Stevens, I'm not going to touch that comment with a 10-foot pole tonight. I don't want to talk about that if I can help it. No. <laughs> Lord I mean, I not. can talk about it if I need to, but I don't want to. No, no. Which because part of the grass carp or the eating them? No. <laughs> we're, we're <laughs> One, if you want to eat a grass carp, you're hungry. I think those are really now, nasty. Now, okay, so we got we got a few more minutes. But I, if you snag them, it is awesome I, to catch I, them in a foot of water. Oh, no <laughs> doubt, no <laughs> doubt. They're strong as an ox. They're bulls. Um, so we'll bring that up. The grass carp that they dumped into Norman. Yep. 
And the uh, news reporter that said that Hydrilla was killing bald eagles. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That was w- awesome. Would you, would you like to comment on that? And was it, in what, fact, Hydrilla or was part? it eelgrass? Or? What part that was... Wait, first of all, has anybody at this table seen a bald eagle at Lake Norman? Yes. I have. Yes. One? I've, I've, seen, I've seen several. I've seen, seen several. Okay. There, there's several down here, too. Yeah, yep. okay. yep, they're here. Um, but it, it, who – I got to I got to tread very lightly on this because I really nah, don't want – go ahead. Who in their right mind – Thought it was a good idea to back a That's what I'm truck talking up about. and dump grass carp in the lake. I mean, I'm really and truly, I'm asking because to okay. hear you talk about it, the grass is a good thing. Okay, and so, to yeah. where where was that disconnect? So here, here's the thing about hydrilla. It's just like Alabama bass. Hydrilla is an invasive plant. It's actually... I.E. not native. Not native. That's okay. It's not even from the United States. Uh, we, okay. okay. Alabama bass is at least from Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in theory. In, in theory. <laughs> and maybe. Maybe not. Um, hydrilla is listed as a federally noxious weed by the federal government. It is actually illegal to own it, transport it, move it, buy it, sell it, whatever. Not illegal state-wise. Illegal federal. fed... Federal. Federally, okay. it is illegal. So, boys guy, and girls, that's wear, real fines and guy, real time. The guys that wear the blue britches, yeah. <laughs> not green it, britches, yeah, blue britches. It, it is. It is. <laughs> so, the there's a there's a group that works for the state of North Carolina. They are called the Division of Water Resources. They are in charge of managing a lot of different things, but they have a subgroup that's in charge of aqua, invasive aquatic plants, and it's their job, whether you like it, don't like it to get rid of invasive aquatic plants. That's their job. And so their number one enemy is hydrilla. Um, So when hydrilla finds its way onto these larger bodies of water, they do their best. Here here comes the the trucks and the grass carp. I know you hate me, and and I get it. It's it's, it's a valid question because people need to know. So they, they work with local entities to stock grass carp in the lake to get rid of because grass carp are very good at eating hydrilla they're also when they when they're starving they're really good at eating eel grass as we found right mm-hmm. and so that's why grass carp were stocked into the lake that is to get rid of the hydrilla um which is gone now correct which is well, <laughs> yeah well so the life cycle of hydrilla is really weird and what makes it a great invasive is that it can basically be dormant for seven to ten years um, so if the grass carp aren't there, say seven years from now, in theory, those hydrilla buds can sprout out of the dirt, and we have hydrilla all over again. Now let me ask you. Let me ask you this: You being the biologist, because I've had this theory. No, no, no. It's it's not bad. Does do you need this? Fraser needs sent me this just now. No, I, okay. I, I'm good. Okay, I, I, I know enough about hydrilla. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I'm just. I appreciate. Is, is it too. is it possible for hydrilla to to be spread from lake to lake through ducks? Yes. It's also it's 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 so its main source of spread. Well, there we think there are several main sources of spread. Probably the main source is boats trailers. Trailers moving from one body of water to another, having mm-hmm. it on their trailer, and it doesn't take much. Just a little tiny sprig is yep. all it needs, and it can establish itself. Um, ducks can move it on their feet. They can have it, you know, waterfowl can have it on their feet, could potentially move it what from one their, body of water to what another. What about their poop? Uh, I mean, that's it. Well, I, mean, I, 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 know, I know a lot of, a lot theory, of ducks feed. In theory, that's what they eat. In theory, it could... Um, Oh, he's texting me about hydrilla eagle toxicity. I know it's toxic, Bill. I, I get that. I, but, but, the, but that's not why they got rid of hydrilla at Lake Norman. But anyway. But that's what the news reporter said. Know, we watch it, the news because the news yeah, is always right. Yeah. And but, so, so hydrilla does produce. So hydrilla does produce a, um, and I'm not going to get it right. The, the initials are AVN. And so when ducks eat hydrilla, they get this AVN, which is a neuropathy, basically, in their brain. And then when an eagle eats the duck, they they get the same AVN. It happens in birds, and it can kill an eagle. It can kill ducks. So hydrilla can kill waterfowl by being consumed. 
So it doesn't always happen, but it can do it. So Hydrilla has that ability. That's what Bill was trying to get me to say. Um, but another source of Hydrilla is really probably ponds, farm ponds and stuff that are in the watershed that in flood events, the Hydrilla washes down, gets in these major reservoirs, gets sprouted, and they grow. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, it's an ongoing battle for the Division of Water Resources. Um, I know fishermen love it. Um, particularly bass fishermen love it, and I get it. Um, the problem is most of the guys around here don't even know what to do with it. So, well, well, I, you know, I, now you're gonna piss somebody off. I don't yeah. care. I'll just <laughs> it, facts. Facts are facts. You know, I but, mean, but I would say, you know, what we're trying to do in places that we can is we're trying to replace it. I, I give you a prime example: is Harris Lake. Harris Lake had hydrilla for a long time. A long time, and then it actually started dying on its own. Okay, a lot of people think they went out and sprayed it, or they went out and did. Somebody said it got sprayed. No, it didn't. It actually died slowly on its own, and we don't really know why. Really, it just started dying out. But DWR identified it as if it's a source population for hydrilla downstream, DWR is coming to get it. I mean, they just are. That's just the way it goes. And so they identified that as a source population. So they stocked a small amount of grass carp in there to take care of the rest of the hydrilla that was there but we have launched the commission has launched because our job is to provide habitat and try to make fishing as good as possible we have launched a five-year program probably going to be 10 year when we get done on establishing habitats at harris lake now harris used to have primrose in it and, and uh, it still does it at does some it, level yep yeah. it still does and it has a lot of cut grass along the bank but we're trying to establish some of these other, like lilies, lotuses, um, eelgrass. If we can get eelgrass to establish, we're trying to provide to make just like take whole coves and provide artificial shallow water habitat that bass would utilize, mm -hmm. and make the whole cove nothing but artificial habitat that bass could get, but not deep habitat like you know two to three foot of water or less, and so. That's a we're into year two or three of that program, and so if you go to Harris, you'll see just tons and tons and tons of work that we're doing. Would love to do that at at a Lake Norman. Now we can't do it everywhere because we're limited in the people power and the yep, money. Absolutely, so, but we would love to do it at Lake Norman. But like I said before, that is a big uphill battle at Lake Norman. Is, is just curiosity the bow fishing at night. I mean, what are the rules on shooting carp? Cannot, Kyle, do you know? You can't, you can't kill grass carp. You it's, cannot kill grass no. carp like Norman. You okay. can shoot the yellow carp and buffaloes and all that, but you, you can't. Can you're shoot, not, you know, you're, it's not that you can't. It's that you're not supposed to kill the grass you carp. Can, you can shoot non-game fishes. That's right. So anything gar, that's listed, whatever. carp, okay. gar, catfish. Um, but the grass carp are but protected. But grass carp are actually protected at Lake Norman and some other lakes. They're not protected everywhere. But they are protected at Lake. But for those of you that want to catch them, grapes and strawberries work really good. <laughs> but you're not supposed to. So just to let you know, they're, they're not to be harvested. Even they're not to be harvested at Lake Norman. When does that run out? Expire. What? The what? grass carp deal. When can that be? Uh, when can you? Could you shoot them? Harvest them? Eat them? Whatever you want to do to them, make fertilizer out of them. Or is that a permanent deal with the lake? It is currently a perm. It is a rule, so it is currently a permanent rule. Now we could rescind that rule eventually, but as long as DWR is actively managing hydrilla at the lake, we will keep that rule in place. Gotcha. So Scott Farmer, we have talked about grass. You got to jump back to the beginning, buddy. Um, Ill grass would be ideal. Water willow would be awesome. Yep. Some of those sorts of things would be good, but... It, it would be nice to have a shoreline grass and a grass that is out in the water, too, yeah. that doesn't come up. You know, it comes up... Such as eel grass. It's not an immer what yeah. they call an immersed vegetation, which is what water willow is, meaning that it comes out of the water. It would be a submersed. It don't, it don't come up in mat. So, yeah, that, so like yeah. hydrilla or, or uh, milfoil or something yeah, like that. Yeah. So there is a possible... And, and all those you just named are invasive. Yeah. <laughs> to, uh, to quote... One of my more favorite movies. So you're saying there is a chance. There's always, there's always a chance. There, there is a chance that the guys from the F1s and the rest of the people that will say 
naysay, whatever, um, that and, we all could get together and make this happen. And I will tell you that the F1 guys that came to me, you know, they were like, look, we get beyond stocking fish if you or or if you decide that habitat is is a is a better way to u- utilize that money that's what the money's for it's to make fishing at Lake Norman better they have said that over and over again well so and, and again know, this point the point of this was to educate not to aggravate not to oh well, step stir, on, stir should, the pot I shouldn't have come then well <laughs> no no because you're aggravating us aggravating you or you aggravating people is educating people on reality of what the potential is. Because Michael Fox, no offense, but posting pictures of Smith Mount Lake every week isn't doing the program due justice that it deserves for what the potential really is. Okay, face it, Norman probably will not be a Smith Mountain. But that doesn't mean we can't make Norman better by doing all the above. It's definitely going to, it'll definitely help it in the long run. It, like, and like Corey said, it's not going to be an overnight fix. It's going to take time. Just, uh, I think we all just need to be patient and do what we can do to help. Jason Land, would a slot limit make a difference on either largemouth or spots? No. No. I, and I mean, I can. We could bring up Harris. I that, remember Falls. We? Yeah, I remember, we, could, we could bring up Harris for that. We, we so, had that discussion earlier today. Yeah, Jason so, Land, there's been a lot of behind the scenes. So, for instance, you know, what they call a slot limit is, is actually probably, in the scientific world, it's actually probably a lim- window limit where you bracket off this group that you can't harvest from. You know, so, for instance, at Harris, I believe it's 16 to 20 inches you yep, can't harvest from. That's right. Well... So what happens is is what we have found over the years, and it's not that Harris is a bad fishery. Don't go home and say, well, the slot <laughs> no. limit is bad. No, or whatever. That's I mean, not what I'm saying. But here's the reality of it. If you look at our data and look at what we found, is that over time, the fish that are in that 16 to 20 inch zone at Harris, their condition is actually lower than the condition of fish that are outside that zone in the condition of the fish that are below that zone because there's so many, they're crowded in that group of fish. Why that is? Other than there's just too many of them? I don't know, but that's just the truth. Those fish actually show lower condition. Well, how, how long has that slot limit been in place it's for been, a long time? For a long time, and here's the thing about rules. If you don't, you if anglers don't go and do it, okay, it doesn't work. I can set all limits in the world. Right. But if you don't go and harvest the fish that are below that slot limit and the fish that are above that slot limit, because we're protecting just those fish in the middle, mm-hmm. if you don't go harvest those other, it doesn't work. It, it, it just crowds them. And so in the bass community, which it's great, I'm not, don't, once again, don't go home and say, Corey's against conservation of bass. It's not but, what I'm but saying. No, the problem is people don't understand what conservation is. Well, I'm going to say that publicly. Crucify well, me. I I'm, don't care. I'm not going. I'm not going to go that far. But but there, there, there are, you know, forever it's been preached: catch and release, catch and release, catch and release, catch and release. And I go back to what I talked about way back at the beginning of this. There is a pasture. There's only so much food in that pasture. And the, if you don't take some of them out, the pasture gets crowded real fast. Yep. And what that means is when they get crowded is they're going to get skinny. They're going to get smaller. And so there's a balance. There's a balance between taking every single one of them out or trying to take every single one of them out and keeping them all in. There is a balance there that will work. And so I, if I could promote anything to bass anglers, is that harvest is not a dirty word. It is oh, not. It's, it's it, not. It actually, functionally, is a good thing overall for the fishery. It will make your fishing better. Conservation with teams a purpose. And I got some buddies watching this podcast. And, and, that'll and our job as biologists <laughs> is to monitor that. Like, if you are taking too many, then we come in and say, hey, look, harvest is pretty doggone high, and it's getting to a, we're getting to a maybe a point where we might need to slow that down that's our job that's what we're supposed to do right but i can tell you there there ain't a bass fishery around that's got that problem 
They just don't. I mean, we don't like you to can our name customers. The, just you can no. name the body, <laughs> you can name the body of water. Um, you can name the body of water, and I pretty much can tell you that there's probably very limited harvest. I mean, for instance, you know, we when when Randleman Lake was first formed. If y'all know where Randleman oh, Lake yeah. is, been over a few it, times. It was pretty popular when it was first formed. The big the big thing was fish are being harvested out of this lake faster than than they can grow, and they're just going out of here like gangbusters. And I'm like, eh, that's just not true. Can't be unless bass fishermen have completely changed what they do. <laughs> it's not true. Well, they didn't believe us. The people that ran the lake didn't believe us, so we decided we're going to do a two year long creel survey. We talked to every angler. That would talk to us that because there's only two entry points in that lake. Yeah. We talked to every angler that came out of that lake and went into that lake, what they did, what they were catching, what they harvested, how they did it, all all those questions. Can you guess what the harvest rate percentage was of Randleman Reservoir largemouth bass? Under two percent. Absolutely. It was like one point five. Really? Okay. You want to huh. you want so it really a good harvest rate is like Probably twenty percent. I mean, wow. seriously. I mean, to make and and for an overcrowded fishery, it might be even higher than that. Everybody that's listening, those are facts. Conservation is great. Conservation with no purpose is pointless. Okay, Bass has preached, you know, catch or release. There's tournament pictures from. Forty years ago, when they used to hold them up on, on the chain, on the chains, yeah, hey, biggest ten, ten. ten fish stringers too, not five and, and or three. You know what? That, that was a bad image. I understand that. That's a bad. That's the that's other. A, that's the other side. Of there, the, there of is the a beach. line in the yeah. middle that's where right. you know what? The Raptor Center in North Carolina will take every pound of fresh fish that you can take them. Use the laws to your advantage and take some fish. Keep it within reason. And honestly, like, for instance, that five fish limit for bass, if people would keep five fish, not every time they went, and I'm not saying keep an eight-pound largemouth. I'm saying keep no. a one-and-a-half-pound largemouth. Right. If people would keep But they don't want to keep those, though. They want to keep the three- or four-pounders. I know. So if you would keep some of that, you know, out of the system, you would actually, if everybody would do that, you would actually see a shift in how those fisheries act and you would get bigger fish more than likely i mean just what i mean that's just the principles that is the basic principles of biology so you're right saying there. if if we had a lake crisco management commission t-shirt we would <laughs> <laughs> we'd do pretty well <laughs> what is it, the old motto kill them and grill them yeah. well, I, i'm not i'm not so i don't want people to take that the wildlife commission is out to get rid of bass or to that's not no, what I'm this preaching. is this is educational but because people don't realize well, he's got to gotta say that fish. because i've been involved he in does some, in no some comments that and, it just goes way down rabbit holes yeah. that and, I, and I'm not and I'm not saying don't be conservation minded. I'm not saying don't be catch and release. That's not what I'm saying. But it's what okay to take saying, some fish every now and again. Yeah, it's okay to take. Shane, kill some fish, buddy. If you gonna eat them, I'll take them to Raptor Center. Spot I don't bass even know where that's great, at. By the way, What's they that? really do taste good. Spot <laughs> bass are really good. He said good. you were better at catching smaller fish than he is. So uh, that's <laughs> I, I catch little ones. They're, they're as close to walleye as I've tasted. Honestly, I wouldn't go that far. Come on that now. Good, but the texture is Yeah, is it's there. about the same. Yeah. yeah, the texture's there. The walleye texture's so, there. So what we've deduced out of this is Dave Anderson should be everybody's hero, except for when he kills three-pounders. Oh, he, <laughs> he he don't call anything. No, he's a no-call He eats pop. them all. <laughs> he's a no-call I, I, Well, I don't know if he eats and, them all, but he kills them all. And honestly, if there are people out there that are like that, uh, that's uh, okay. Uh, uh, like, Michael Kennard, that's that's the best. That's the best question you asked all night, buddy. He, this guy wants to know if if uh, grinding up small Alabamas on the lake and it adds nutrients to the lake. It might. <laughs> there you go. It helped the catfish. They'd like it. Well, I don't know if we need to help those any more than they've already been helped. No, they've been helped enough. All right. Well, we've eclipsed two hours, guys. I hope. Honestly, that this has been informative for and everybody he, and, and helpful too, as far as trying to get everybody together on this topic. You know, like I said, we've all had, we've all been on opposite ends and been on both ends, and hopefully we'll get some clarification. I know I got some myself tonight. And um, listen, and you know what? I, I before we go, Matt Haywood really did 
make a statement that needs to be made. He said he's in for F1s, but there's more to it. And, cert- and for certain reasons, that's why 30000 has not been reached of the goal that they've set yet. The money that people have that fish Norman all the time that hasn't donated, dude, you got to learn how to type. Or I need to learn how to read <laughs> one of the two. Maybe a little of both. <laughs> uh, would probably rather wait until more information like what we've done tonight to donate money. Sure, I can understand that. So... You know what, for those of you that were on the fence to to do anything, I, I hope we've helped unify the group as a whole. Sound like we got some fish fries ahead of us at the boat. You That's know what it sounds like, don't it? Lake Crisco. Baby. I don't mind hey. catching. I don't mind catching them or and giving them to people, but I refuse to clean them. I'm gonna tell you what. Lisa, <laughs> while you're there, take all the white perch you got too. Le- Lisa, hey, now those are good to eat. They, but, they are. They're delicious. You, know, you can do yeah. a pound bonus for every ten you know pounds of small spotted bass. Why not? Why not take the F1 stocking tournaments and have. A fish fry. There's a couple of guys around Norman that I know well, they, know how to cook. Now, I, in their defense, they initially wanted to do that. They did initially, and people like me, I'm the guilty. Idea. I raised them. hell about it. Yeah, got I'll be the them. first one to tell you, I raised hell about it. But in my defense, they said they want to do it with all, all spotted bass. All of them. See, if you would have come to me and said, "Hey, we're going to do this with <laughs> with spotted bass under 15 inches," hey, I'd have been right there with you. So, that being said, if you want to do something like that, as long as they're under 15 inches, I'll fill up both live wheels. All right, Mike. <laughs> Mike Langford said he'll clean them. So, all we need is a grease man and... Uh, a, Somebody to donate some cooking oil. And some cooking Rob oil. Die. Rock and Rob, roll. Rob, Rob Dye. House Autry on them dang things. <laughs> house Autry and cooking oil. Let's go. <laughs> Rob Dye and Todd Alton. We need to make them fry them up because they them some fish eating some of the guns. Well, all, all I'm saying is you know what let's all work together okay the banter back and forth is fun but i've seen it get too personal yeah it really has we're all here i don't care what your past is what decisions good bad or indifferent you've made in the past we all as a group of anglers have an opportunity to do good so let's take that time to do good instead of trying to destroy other people that don't have ideas that you agree with in the process that's all the peacemaker talk i got for tonight guys are there any more questions you got any more comments no I, you I look appreciate- like you're about winded and that match yeah. is telling you <laughs> no I, i'm good uh i'll be here till you tell me to go home i appreciate the opportunity to come speak and you know we appreciate you coming man you thank want, you so if much you want to have me back sometime talk about something totally different or the same thing i don't matter we well do it. we're so, at some point we're gonna have a talk about wiley because it is a very odd bird being the fact that it's a border lake <laughs> and, and everybody has to work together. Somebody there. got a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> I got a whole fridge up. <laughs> it, it is a can of worms, but my goal here in the near future is to try to get rid of the bad worms and make it one happy can of worms. Understood. So we're not going to do that. <laughs> Just deal with the positive stuff. Let the turds float. T- but that's the, <laughs> that's the point. Is is you know what the turds are going to float. Yep. Just like it normally. They're going to go downstream. Just let them keep rolling. But oh, everybody, let's work together. Thank you guys for watching. Rusty hooks live. Where our hooks may be rusty, but our points are always sharp. Good night. Are we?